cannot be drinking at 9.44 a.m. It's a podcast beer. I always have a podcast beer. It's not. Okay. All right. <laughs> I feel like that's maybe we're, an unhealthy habit. To, yeah. I got a podcast bang. I haven't drank bang since I worked for the railroad. So I, uh, I feel it's fitting. <laughs> have you ever had the, the, the C4 Skittles? Oh, God. Super good. Uh, uh, they make, The what? It's an energy <laughs> drink. It's 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 called C4, so but it tastes like Skittles. So fucking good, though. So tasty. <laughs> One time I had like a 17 hour work day for a blizzard Fuck at uh, the railroad. And uh, what was it? Fuck. We I had two bangs and I thought I had a heart attack by the end of the day. That was, is, is, that is, was is an a, awful is, decision. Is a bang like a like a railroad rip it? Uh no, it's uh it's just like this chud made yes. uh yes. workout yes. drink yes. that's yes. just like yes, raw. Yes, so it like is. you're yes, trading yes, days yes, at the yes, end of your is. life to be yes, awake yes, for Yes, day. that's exactly yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool that the railroad has rippets. Um yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I the railroad I, gives you cancer in other ways. Mm. Uh, yeah. oh, don't breathe that in, folks. Yeah, <sighs> don't breathe uh, this. Don't breathe this. I I really like I uh, I don't know. I, I I'm sort of a purist, and I I think my my true love is gonna be regular Red Bull for the rest of my life. But mm. I I respect the bang. I respect the C4. Where the fuck is? Oh, never mind. I'm I'm simply drinking a strawberry flavored bubble tea. Um, I'm actually drinking uh an unflavored seltzer. I've 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 lost my way. We're getting a lot. Uh, and I'm not we're drinking old and we're getting again, normie. it's 9.46 a.m. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, hello, and welcome to Well, There's Your Problem. Hi, Roz. Uh, it's a podcast about engineering disasters with slides. And I'm a troubling relationship Rosneck. with alcohol. Yes. Yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. And energy drinks. <laughs> yeah. I'm Justin Rosniak. I'm the person who's talking right now. My pronouns are he and him. Okay, go. I am Alice Caldwell Kelly. I'm the person who's talking now. My pronouns are she and her. Yay, Liam. Hi, I'm Liam Anderson. My pronouns are he and him. Sorry for screaming that just no, now. No, it's fine. My bad. High energy, Liam. Yeah, you never get this. Normally, I'm very morose, so, you know, in, in, enjoy it. Um, You've become too powerful now that you're not, like, at work during the day, right? I, I, I gotta say, uh, obviously, thank you, Patreon subscribers, for allowing me to not live in poverty while I record this. Um... But uh, it's it's very funny to me because now that I'm not working a bullshit nine to five, I am I am the happiest I've been in years. Uh, it's like a yoke has been lifted off me. Last you week I volunteered at a two dollars a month. You made this man happy. Yeah, <laughs> I volunteered at a at a food pantry in my neighborhood the other day, and I was just happy as shit to be breaking down boxes, putting up boxes. I uh, yeah, super super fun. So uh, I'm going on vacation. Tomorrow, uh, nice. whenever this records, uh, with with Roz, super excited. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm in a good mood. Uh, it's really fucking alien to me, and we have a guest. And we have a guest. <laughs> yes. Howdy. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm Brian. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. Uh, gender is a mess. Uh, ex maintenance away management uh, from a class one railroad in the Western United States, and uh, yeah, excited to be on. Cool, thanks yeah. so much for coming. Oh, and I guess I'm four foot and a half on Twitter, but uh, I guess we can just play that in the... Are uh, you, are you actually four... Uh, oh. oh, that's just the gauge of track. That's what I, <laughs> I thought. I, oh, now I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm six one. so... <laughs> hey, me too! Damn, how's the weather up there? Down here in 5'7 country. Are you 5'7"? I'm five so foot seven. Yes, oh. are built like goddamn telephone poles. Like Alan's, like what six five or something, and then like a bunch yeah. of other people I've met are all giants. Yeah, but that's everyone, why you become an urbanist. You're like walking around, you can actually see the city, and you're like, damn, this shit sucks. I'm down here. What, like <laughs> six eight? Jay has got to be six hell. four. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I, I'm just and like we have looking Zorak, at people's the shoulders. Out the spectrum. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Welcome back to Well, There's Your Problem. It's a podcast about other people's heights. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> so, uh, what, what you see on the screen in front of you is uh, a train. Yeah. Oh. What is kind of wrecked and on fire. So, somewhere in this wreck is the original recording that we did about this. When yeah, we, and yeah. then we decided it was like too bad to it. be released. Yeah. It could never be, be heard. 
Yeah, I just had I, so many more thoughts about the thing by the end of that weekend. I was like, okay, all of this is wrong. I, no shit leaves the shop, you know. No shit yeah. leaves the shop, exactly. Except for all the shit yeah. that has left the shop. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't, worry about that. don't worry about that one, though. Uh, anyway, this train is not supposed to be like this. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Ideally, it safely reaches its destination rather than piling up into a heap and catching fire. And And... Giving a lot of people a lot of uh, uh, some sort of breathing disorder. We're yeah. really on our sort of like um, hidden sort of like wave of environmental like illness catastrophes. A shit, whole lately. town full of Corinne McGraths. Yeah, <laughs> it was uh, so close too. It was, it was like what only fifty track miles from the end of its run. Twenty. Oh, that tr that train <laughs> had one hour left until retirement. All right, yeah. maybe more than an hour, let's be honest, but <laughs> that train had five hours left in Silver Time. <laughs> it's Norfolk Southern, you know, they're not getting there that fast. Well, I just they just uh they'd get within like three miles and get stacked up on the yard lead. <laughs> but like that one uh post from Uday Schultz where it shows like how late trains are. How, how on tall is he anyway? Curve. Short as shit. At least he has short as <laughs> shit energy. Sorry, Uday. I'm sure no, he's <laughs> like he's like about my my height, I think. You're short too, bud. The I'm closer six foot. one is to you New York are, City. Oh, the shorter oh, you are. Are you six foot, Ross? No, that's not even that's not even rounding up from five eleven. It's six foot flat. I know you are. I know you are. <laughs> I I have a copy of your, your identification papers. Why? <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> that uh that In case I ever need to go ahead. Oh, that post from Uday jokerified me when I saw train numbers that when I was working I would be hung if I had delayed them for 30 minutes and NS was just running them 17 hours late. Just normal. Jesus. <laughs> like, holy shit, Norfolk Southern. <laughs> yeah. <on> a railroad. <laughs> yeah, so uh, t today we're going to talk about the East Palestine train derailment that Norfolk Southern recently did and has been mm. in the news for a little bit. Again. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. Don't breathe that in, folks. Mm -hmm. But first, we have to do the goddamn news. Strikes luck. Strike, yeah. Strike to action gets the goods. Uh, Writers Guild of America is going on strike. 97.5 approval of it. Yeah. I don't know exactly what for. I, I don't know. I support anyone striking for any reason at any time. Um, yeah, for that's, as that's sort a good of like, point. Yeah. As vexatious a reason as possible. Um, yeah, like, sure, whatever. Um, also, I believe, like, Rutgers, their strike, that's Success like, they, they won, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, writer pay has gone down. So as far as I know, the basically the, the chief demand is give us more money. And yeah, cool. pay up, motherfuckers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Otherwise, y you won't get the. I mean, okay, look, the, the all TV writing is shit now, but still, you deserve to be well paid, even if you're doing a terrible job. Um, that's the cornerstone yeah. of my political beliefs. It's why I'm, you know, I support, you know, because you know, look at our Patreon, right? I do a terrible job with this, I get paid. No, um, you don't. I do a, ter <laughs> a terrible job with it. No, it's not the case. Uh, but like, yeah, I think if you if you um. If your job is to write, you know, uh, they fly now, they fly now. You should also have a living wage off of that. Um, so, yeah, all, all power yeah. to the workers, even if in yes. this case they are cringe. Especially in an industry like Hollywood, where it's just... Oh, like, Jesus, yeah. It's a nightmare vortex. Like, mm. yeah, they these people need that, like, any sort of protection they can get. Well, we've talked to a um, friend of the show, Noah, about this before, and... Right. Or, like one of the things that strikes me is that Hollywood is one of the industries that's been most successful at doing its own mythology for like decades and decades because nobody ever goes like, uh, "Am I gonna make it as a steel worker?" You know, because right. like, yeah. am I good? <laughs> am I good enough to be driving delivery trucks for a living? You know, I, I really have to like, I have to like pay my dues. I have to like, you know, do all of this shit, and then maybe I'm just not good enough. Whereas Hollywood, like, uh, you really get this sort of like internalized shit 
And it's good to see people overcome and be like, no, this is this is labor, and I should get fucking paid correctly. Well, yeah. It's also that like I think there's there's a thing. You know, I'm not a labor expert. I I know the things I know, but I. Uh, you know, as we shift to streaming services and there's a lot of people that aren't getting paid what they're worth or relative to their experience. Um, yeah, uh, all I, I have to say about that is pay up, motherfucker, especially mm -hmm. because residuals have gone down as far as I know. I know yeah, very little also, about this as I said, but it's, it's also one of the reasons why uh, all of your favorite shows get canceled after two seasons is because yes. it's a, like a, a loophole for Netflix that you have to start paying uh, uh, like stuff more after the third season starts. Um, so they just cancel it and they just commission something else new. Um, you can't even coming... get the live, the fucking uh, Love Is Blind live stream to work. Why should I believe? Uh... <laughs> it was a technique pioneered, I believe, by Nickelodeon. Hmm. Uh, they, they canceled Angry Beavers after three seasons, even though, uh, even though it was extremely popular. <laughs> yeah, Angry Beavers had four seasons, bud. Was it four seasons? Yeah, it was four. Seasons. No, they're still motherfuckers. Thought, didn't they make a? Uh, the fourth season came like way after the first three, or am I, uh, am I misremembering? There's, 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 there's no. no justice for these things because The Simpsons is like a you know like a horse that's broken three legs and is still limping. <laughs> yeah, it's doing right. like up to season fifty thousand or whatever. Venture Brothers had to like fight that I really scratch. Liked that got oh canceled. yeah, yeah, I've been meaning to watch that. Yeah, oh, uh, I really like that. Yeah. Um, like I, I, I have a weakness for that kind of fucking animation shit. And like, honestly, like, you know, give me a cartoon that tells me how smart I am. Um, this is and... why we need the WGA to win so that shows mm -hmm. will be good again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't. I yeah. I, there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of prestige TV. I just I can't bring myself to give shit about. <laughs> But, uh, this is this is sort of the, like the cheesesteak part of this episode where we're just like right. talking about TV. Oh, shows. people we're get like, mad at us. People got mad at us for that in the comments. Like, what are you talking about? Like, we got a bunch a of Philadelphia-based podcasts. I I also assume because we blew up on Reddit, unfortunately, that people are like, oh, I'll check it out because it'll make me smarter. No, it won't. We will make you dumber. We will yes, make you way yeah. fucking. We will make dumber. you dumber and angrier. Yeah. My apologies to anyone who has come here out of the blue for real serious information about Hello, East mate. Palestine. It will be in the podcast, but you're you going to have to, like, to wait yeah. a bit. <laughs> yeah, we're we'll elected we'll, we'll for, it to you. Uh, you know, getting into the meat of the of the class, you know. Yeah. You got to mm. have your, your humanities and stuff before you get to the engineering stuff. That's true. Right? Also, like YouTube, YouTube has like a, a a time of thing on it. You can just skip ahead. We're not gonna get That's mad at you point, for yeah. doing that. Yeah, you can just you, can you can just do. That. You don't right. have to listen to people. Skip we too. can't get mad at you because we're a recording. That's I actually right. do like the the people who are like, here are the timestamps of when they actually like start covering the subject yeah. uh, of the episode. Yeah, that's cool. It's like, um, thanks. <laughs> we, we could put in video chapters for that, maybe something to look into. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, the other thing that that strikes me is that like the some of the best feedback we get for the show and the stuff that makes me feel really good about it is people who are like, yeah, I work the most miserable job you've ever heard. I like, I don't know, I'm the live-in security guard for a cesspit or something. Um, and like, I, I, I do like a seven hour shift. So what I like to do is put on like two episodes of your podcast and it just takes me right through. And I'm like, yeah, cool. I, I, I no longer feel bad about doing like a five hour episode now. I, yeah. I used to do a, a, a meaningless, uh, a meaningless like data entry job uh at a bank it was like it was decent pay the benefits were trash so on and so forth and that mm -hmm. was how i plowed through all of hardcore history in like a few months oh yeah, yeah. that'll do that to you you know yeah. um uh, all right thing. Let's, this, let's, this is let's, it, <laughs> This is why we need to do socialism, right? Is because like uh, being able to make sort of like Patreon podcast money is a preview of what a functional economy looks like, and for some reason, it's only accessible to us. Because like, if all the people listening were also able to be like, yeah, I just I don't need to get up for work. I just do, you know, I go to food bank, whatever, you know, that would be infinity times better. But instead, we're just sort of like numbing some of the pain of like all of the reasons why the economy is terrible. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that I, I do love the people's I've gotten a couple DMs on Twitter that are very sweet that are like, hey, like, you know, I, I, I'm a truck like a, a, a long, a long haul trucker. And I just put mm. on your show and sort of like, just do my route. I was like, that's cool. Like, I'm I'm really 
honored and happy to hear that. Yeah. And then you get my parents who are just like, yeah, we listened to your Rana Plaza episode. Now, what I don't understand is why you would put a shopping mall <laughs> on top of a, a residential. Do I have that right, Liam? And it's like, Dad, fucking it's yeah. 8 a.m. <laughs> like, <laughs> I started watching Franklin uh, in a hotel room when I was working at Tie Gang. So, uh, mm. yeah, you know, Franklin yeah, episode was, was... thirteen. I'm happy to announce is coming out, except that I'm doing it. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's entirely about the mics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's 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 world building. It's very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in in other news. <laughs> Geopolitics, Fuck. folks. Uh, mm. Shit's fucked once again, um, and 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 shit's fucked in a, a place that a lot of people hadn't been paying attention to, which is Sudan. Um, and the thing about Sudan is that um, it, it tried to have two militaries, the actual military, and then the uh, this sort of like paramilitary militia called the RSF, the Rapid Support Forces, which grew out of the Janjaweed, which was <gasps> the militia that did the genocide in Darfur. Um, right. So nice guys, as you can imagine. Um, right. And essentially what happened is the, the commanders of these two separate militaries developed beef, which is the thing that you don't want. Um, and the RSF tried to like seize all the radio stations and shit like that. Uh, they actually briefly captured a handful of Egyptian soldiers who were there on exercise, which is going to be very embarrassing to the Egyptians. Flip some of their MiGs too, I think, right? Yep, yep. Um, and so now the, the Sudanese army is like going house to house. Uh, many people are getting shot, some of them even on purpose. Uh, Sudan has an air force still, um, which is currently, you know, uh, bombing the urban centers of Sudan. Uh, and uh, all in all, it's it's a mess. And I I'm not sure how much productive I can say about it, other than the fact that uh, it, it's helpful to have one military. Yeah, I was gonna say I I think you know in, in terms of like dictator 101, uh, don't you want to mm. keep your sort of brown shirted thugs you want to sort of keep them not not capable of large military well, operations you want to this keep that sort of, of like, an informal operation this this is the aftermath of a dictatorship because they ousted their dictator omar al bashir back in 2021 right yeah uh, was and a then, couple years ago yes yeah yeah and and the idea was like oh we'll just transition to like uh you know civilian led democracy the real military the first military just did a coup and then there was yeah. some like pro sort of process of negotiation where they were like, "Yeah, we're going to transition in back into like democracy." Um, and now this, um, and yeah. it's it's one of those conflicts where like the international institutions like the UN and the African Union and the EU are like very heavily involved, and so it's like laden down with fucking acronyms and processes and meetings and protocols, and the upshot of all of those is sort of nothing in this case. Well, <laughs> that's my little like five minute briefing, you know, on 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 Sudan. It's definitely is one of those shit's fucked. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely one of those conflicts where like, I don't recommend looking up anything on Twitter because you're gonna see horrific footage, mm -hmm. so, worse yes. than Ukraine stuff. So spare yeah, your I mean, uh, curiosity. Yeah, and it's 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 surprising too. Like this is um like uh. Khartoum and Port Sudan aren't really like like a history of any of this shit happening, um, and now it is like roadblocks in the streets and like air raids and shit, um, and it's uh, it, it's very very dramatic and very frightening. <laughs> so that's the the, the official yeah, like that, podcast yeah. position on Sudan is uh, uh I, I mean I've made this joke before on Twitter that like OSINT like open source intelligence whatever is like seeing the wildest shit you've ever seen in your life on like a a, a Twitter video or a YouTube video and being like oh damn that's sort of my my takeaway from Sudan is like oh damn yeah yeah it's, well apparently we've gotten a 24 hour ceasefire so. Yeah, start, I, I'm I not sure how, how closely anyone's I mean, going to observe There have been that, hospitals but... directly targeted, which is super great. Uh, mm, as fantastic. far as I can make out, uh, basically both sides are uh, genocidal monsters. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. But, yeah, uh, I mean, that sounds right. It, it, it oh. seems like one of those things where neither of them is particularly ideological. Um, right, it's just a struggle for power, as it mm -hmm. always is. Well, militaries, folks. Mm -hmm. You only yeah. need one of them. 
Yes. <laughs> bad. And don't make them equal size. Yeah. <laughs> Inside you, there are there, there, are, there two are two militaries. armies. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that was the goddamn news. All right. First, All right. we must ask ourselves, what is train? What, what, is, what is train? What is train accident? And mm. I think it's, it's fun here to, to go back to one of the first rail accidents in American history, which is remarkably similar to the rail accident we're mainly going to talk about today. Um, and that was the Heightstown wreck in 1833 on the Camden and Amboy Railroad in New Jersey, right? And so this was November 8th, 1833. Uh, a passenger train from South Amboy, New Jersey, to Bordentown, New Jersey, had a mechanical problem at Heightstown, which was an improperly lubricated bearing, right? Which mm. caught fire. as the, the bearing between uh, the train car and the axle, right? Um, it, it overheated, it caught fire, and it failed, and the train derailed at a whopping 20 miles an hour. Holy shit. I mean, th that yeah. was the sort of speed they thought that, like, your uterus your would, would fall out. out. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know anatomy, don't get mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> They're in the, the same department, I don't know. Uh, you think 20 miles an hour doesn't seem that bad, but you gotta remember all the, 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 the train cars were just made of sticks. Right, it's like so, it's made of sticks. It's all hard edges as well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, lots also, of splinters. people had like fewer hit points back then. This is the yes. thing I've determined is that like y y you, you or I now, we might have oh you know a hundred hit points, something like that. Well, we would consider to be a normal sized hit bar. Uh, you, you're sort of like your average guy back then walking around four or five. Um, you know, falls wrong, dies. Um, gets a cough, dies. Um, just you know, the thing about your ancestors is they were pussies and they were weak. Um, and yeah, some yes. kind of fainting disease brought up, brought upon by a particularly <laughs> withering comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a mean YouTube comment would break my ancestors' brains. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my, my, my ancestors, not, not who, who like presumably spent all day shoveling coal into steam engines and shit, they they could not have done my job. Um, no, 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 no. They don't have the like strength of character it requires. Yeah. So twenty one passengers were injured. One passenger died instantly. Another one died later. Um, the only passenger on the train who was uninjured was former President John Quincy Adams. Ooh, weird looking dude, by the way. Yeah. Oh, Looks like a fucking yeah. haunted Sam the Eagle. Um, uh, believed that Americans invented having sex outdoors. Uh, used to swim the Potomac naked. Oh, he sure uh, did. I, I, I just got all this like off the dome about John Quincy Adams. Huge John Quincy Adams guy. head here. Uh, yeah, terrific yeah, yeah. diplomat, not that's, great that's president. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also aboard was steamboat magnate and future railroad baron Cornelius Vanderbilt, who was said to have sworn never to set foot on a train again. And uh, well, he proved himself it. wrong there. Um, yeah, I mean, the money's too good not to, right? Like, exactly. Uh, I trust was a family with multiple Cornelii, I'll say that. It's yeah. A, it's a banger of a name. We'll say that. That's true. That's true. But I think if you did it now, like if you named a kid Cornelius, you're just like sentencing them to like inf like infinity bullying. Yeah, is there like That's a true. is there like a, a short word for Cornelius? Do they call Corny. it Corny? Corn. My my, my Corn. son Corny. Yeah. <laughs> So this you do like first... Cornelia, but that's sort of like more of a British like columnist vibe, you know? Yeah, yeah. That lady hates uh, hates trans people. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, and has nine divorces and and all sorts of other <laughs> slurs you've never heard of. Yeah, invents yeah. new ones. Yeah. So this was the first fatal accident of a passenger train in the United States of America, and I will now use history to demonstrate that. Uh, 190 years later, we have learned nothing and are having exactly the same problems. <laughs> God bless I'm the USA. Circle. Yeah. How do we get this thing we call Norfolk Southern? That's the next question we're going to ask. Ooh, railroad amalgamation again. 
Yes. I say um, again, like we haven't already done all of this, and I'm just like yeah. trying to re remember the jokes yeah. that I made. <laughs> I added some more details. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, what is Norfolk Southern? Well, it's the merger of a couple railroads. We got to talk about uh, the one, which is the Norfolk and Western, uh, which involves a weird guy, right? We love a we weird guy, dude. Yeah. Dude. yeah. <laughs> so the, the it starts as the Norfolk and Petersburg Railroad. It's founded by a weird guy, William Mahone, right? Uh, William Mahone, or more commonly known as Billy. Uh, he he. So he he's a Southerner. He narrowly escaped Nat Turner's rebellion in 1831. Uh, he was educated at VMI, but rather than taking a commission, yes. he went to go work on a railroad, which is sort of what you do back then: is you go to a military academy, and then you don't Free go into the military. You start a and railroad. Then you're just like, yeah, yeah <laughs> no, I'm not going to do any of that shit. Yeah. So they start construction on that railroad in 1853. Uh, Billy Mahone was faced with a problem familiar to some listeners of this podcast, which is how to build something on the Great Dismal Swamp. Um, <laughs> well, uh, railroad <laughs> code, lots of mismatched windows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Grover Railroad. <laughs> Actually, he does not Grover up the railroad. He he His solution is a corduroy road, which still forms the, the basis that? for... Nor it's a bunch of logs stacked on top of each other, and then you put dirt on top. Why is it called a corduroy road? Because it looks like corduroy. Does it? Ah, uh, yeah. You know, because okay. it's logs. Uh, yeah. Okay. I don't. Well, that's still what the, corduroy the, the, looks like. The Norfolk Southern roadbed is uh, still based on that corduroy road to to this day. So huh. worked pretty good. I mean, um, fucking putting putting like logs in the ground. It worked for you know Venice or whatever. It stays up. Like yeah. His railroad career is, of course, interrupted by the Civil War. Uh, Billy Mahone is, of course, commissioned into the Confederate Army. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly promoted to Brigadier General. Uh, he is most famous for actions at the Battle of the Crater, right? Oh, Which yeah, is a big unforced yes. error. We should... <laughs> yes. Yeah, the good yeah, guys yeah. fucked this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Embarrassing. I mean, Stop is, running is, into the crater. <laughs> it's, it's sort of like prefigures. <laughs> yeah, sort of prefigures a lot of mine warfare in the First World yeah. War as well, which is you, you, the plan is you're going to like sap and like undermine the enemy's positions, blow an enormous charge, like kill a bunch of them at once, and then like charge through the crater or around the crater. Yeah. And what the Union does yeah. is they like, blow up the mine. Charge into the crater, stand there, mill around, and get war crimed by the Confederates. Yes, um, this is my crater, and it was made for me. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, there was a lot of like um, not taking of prisoners here specifically, oh, yeah. and that had a like yeah, a, a yeah. distinct racial component, as if I remember correctly, because it was, it was uh, black yes. troops on the Union side. Yes. I'll, 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 although Mahone was said to have tried to stop them from war criming black captured black troops. Oh thanks guy. Uh, good, good, yeah. good for him. Frank Furnish yeah. shot this fucker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it gets weirder, right? Oh uh, really? In railroad lore it gets weirder? Are you sure? I know, right? Uh so after the war he goes back to what he really likes doing, which is railroads. He gains control of two other railroads, merges them all into the Atlantic, Mississippi and Ohio Railroad. But then the panic of eighteen seventy three hits. He loses control of the AMO to uh, Clarence Howard Clark of Philadelphia, which uh, is the guy who uh, Clark Park in West Philly is named after. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, so he's he's really tied in with the Philadelphia elite. His father made a boatload of money doing finance when the charter of the Second Bank of the United States expired, um, you know, because all of a sudden the financial markets were in chaos. Uh, and it was if you, if you knew what you were doing, you can make a lot of money. Uh, he's a founding member of the Union League. He's one of the earliest developers in West Philadelphia. Uh, he changes it to the Norfolk and Western, right? That's that's so when the Norfolk like and Northern Western. Northern rich boy just kicks him out of his own thing and wins the Civil War again. Yes. Nice. Scoreboard, wow. baby. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't does... love the sort of like uh, <laughs> sort of like aristocracy <laughs> of uh, like Philadelphia, but yeah, you know, relatively speaking. Yeah. Well, Mahone goes on to a life in politics, and he, he essentially founds what was called the Readjuster Party, right? And the Readjuster Party is this uh, Reconstruction Era political party in Virginia, which is sort of this multiracial 
sort of radical, maybe not quite anti-capitalist, but certainly radical for the day movement, which was formed around a common cause of uh, make West Virginia pay for our shit. Um, (laughs) (laughs) if if that isn't ever a land of contrasts right like Mm -hmm. i i I like the the multiracial policy i like the radical policy i'm not sure why west virginia is in this a unified front against west virginia yeah (laughs) prior to the civil war west virginia was part of virginia right and West Virginia had a lot of debts to service from before the war for funding things like public infrastructure, railroad, stuff like that, you know? And uh, the readjuster's argument was that the pre-war debts assigned to Virginia should be proportionally allocated to West Virginia owing to their secession. Um, oh, I mean, that's, then, don't, don't get on your high horse about secession when Virginia also seceded. Like, well, you know... Uh, but then they'd use this extra money to improve education, fix destroyed infrastructure, so on and so forth. But this coalition really, really hinged on racial equality, right? Especially in the form of doing stuff like repealing the poll tax. Um, cause otherwise you had, you know, the, 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 it was between the readjusters and I want to say the conservatives who were, they, they were the guys who were like, nah, I just pay all the debts because they had a vested interest in getting that money back. Um, you know, uh, but the, the readjusters sort of go through and, you know, they, they, they don't make much progress on the debt front. What they do make progress in is like building schools, especially for African-Americans. Uh, they, 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 they repeal the poll tax. So African-Americans can vote. They, uh, you know, they wind up with, uh, the first majority black city council being elected wow. in Bullshit. Danville, Virginia. Including, and they instituted a integrated police force, completely unprecedented. Wow. Um, you know, so and, and th- this all is this a- purely in furtherance of fuck West Virginia, fuck West Virginia, yeah. 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 <laughs> West Virginia will pay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I yeah, it, Mahone does a real big about face on the whole Confederacy thing after the war. Um, <laughs> I think maybe maybe one of the only people who went beyond just saying they were sad about it. Um, <laughs> it seems about as best case scenario as you can yeah. get for right. someone who is a Confederate officer. Yeah. Now, the the one issue is, of course, this this readjuster party. Uh, a lot of aspects of it are very much supported by the federal institution of Reconstruction, right? And when Reconstruction stops and the troops go home. Uh, racists pretty quickly forced their way back into power. Oh, so, sure. um, yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, weird he, dude. He, yeah, weird dude. Weird, weird dude. dude. He's, uh, uh, my uncle Robert has a stalled out, uh, biography on him. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, so, you know, by this point, the, the, the Norfolk and Western Railroad is de facto controlled by the Pennsylvania Railroad, which is a situation that only gets more formalized until they were forced to divest in the 1968 Penn Central merger. Um, this is like one of a billion railroads that just get eaten by the Pennsylvania Railroad, right? Uh, yeah, this was the one that they were kind of stealing from to keep their own checks and balance. Oh, yeah, okay. so like mm. NNW kind of like fed a lot of traffic into the Pennsylvania Railroad, and once they chopped it off, they cho- it. It was like cutting their legs off to merge into New York Central to do that. So yeah, huh. yeah, that kind of like, that crippled the railroad more than I think anyone anticipated. <laughs> and then NNW immediately went to outflank them, trying to gobble up as many railroads as possible. Oh yeah, so. They got real big, real quick. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. They did not waste time. Now, the other component of Norfolk Southern is the Southern Railway, right? Southern serves the South, bud. Yeah. Activating Benoit Blanc mode at this time. Yeah. <laughs> there's uh, f- uh, fewer colorful characters in this story, but there's this guy, Samuel Spencer. He's another Confederate, but not so prominent. He was just in the cavalry, right? Um, 
Uh, but he Frank also Spanish had this shot his ass too. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> he had a long sure real life career. My, my like my platform now is that every sort of like Frank Furness should have executed all these people, but by <laughs> Frank Furness specifically yeah. and personally. It's very funny though. Uh, he had a, a pretty long railroad career. He was president of both the Baltimore and Ohio Railroads and the Long Island Railroad. Uh, but he eventually goes to work uh, for an investment bank, Drexel Morgan and Company. More, oh, if you more... want some some sordid uh, railroad financing tales, uh, Ron Chernow's House of Morgan is very good for that. Yeah, and so he's like working Morgan, there. another weird looking dude. Yeah, and, t- and, ask him about his nose. He hated yeah. that. And Anthony Joseph Drexel. Um, hmm. Samuel Spencer sees opportunity here. Uh, the railroad network of the South was very fractured and disconnected, very quickly running out of money. Labor was very cheap, however, uh, especially after Reconstruction ended, and suddenly yeah, there was. I this, wonder why. Yeah. 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 <laughs> suddenly there was this massive pool of. Uh, Largely African American convict labor, um, and building a railroad is a hard, miserable job that you more or less have to force people to do. Cool, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> um, so Drexel Morgan and Company buys out a bunch of these railroads and creates the Southern Railway, with uh, Spencer as its president in 1894. Right um, now. This is an interesting one. Most railroads in the United States are named railroad. Uh, why is it the Southern Railway? Why is it? Because they want to be English so fucking good. Yeah, yes, because they're they're what? all planters cosplaying as aristocrats. Yeah, <laughs> they're legal files. Yeah, what? freaks. No fucking. Yeah, that's that, your is, fault, Alice. <laughs> is is, is, is that why it's yellow and honest. green like the the yes. like the British Southern yes. Railway too? Yes. Oh yeah. my god. They were just. Utterly sickos when it comes to British <laughs> like southern like uh, uh, what uh, what's the British equivalent of a weeb like it, oh my yeah, god yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is horrifying yeah I mean the fucking the logo looks like a hate symbol already for one thing <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> um. So Spencer works pretty hard to expand the system, diversify traffic before being killed in a train crash, ironically, in 1906. Uh, live by the um, sword, die by the sword. List of inventors killed by their own inventions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, killed by his invention, the Southern Railway. Um, now, by the 1920s, this was a big, dumb railroad that went all the way from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans. Um, you know, it historically had a very military culture, sort of even more so than a lot of the other railroads that also had very military cultures. <laughs> cool. Um, I bet I bet they were fun to work for. Oh my god. I mean, yeah, getting fired on the today. spot was just a, a part just of the cost shot. of doing yeah. business. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. By Frank Furness, ironically. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, a lot of people I worked with were ex-military. The railroad loves ex-military people because they're the on- some of the only people who are like, oh, this nightmare work life is an upgrade. So. <laughs> 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 like, they, that are like, I mean, I, I knew a lot of people who are like ex-prison guards and they were just double dipping for their second, uh, you know, they did 20 years of working at a prison system and then 20 years at the railroad. So they'll just get like, you know, for all five years that they'll survive after retirement, uh, you know, they'll have like a good you know, five thousand dollars a month or something. <laughs> <laughs> so in the early 20th century, there's lots of these attempts to consolidate railroads into much bigger systems. A lot of them fail miserably. Um once the railroad listen start... to like the entire fifty hour Conrail saga. I know, we right? Did. Uh, Once that. the railroads start hurting financially in the '60s, stuff get starts get go, getting uh, these mergers start to get going, right? So, like the Pennsylvania Railroad, the New York Central become the Penn Central. There's other big mergers like Great Northern and the Chicago Burlington and Quincy, which becomes the Burlington Northern. Uh, the Norfolk and Western starts really aggressively acquiring other railroads. Um, the Southern Railway is more complacent to sort of stay regional 
Right. Southern aristocracy? Complacent and regional? You're kidding mm-hmm. me. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> like, like NNW and like uh, the Chessy system were just fueled by like piles of subbituminous coal that they're just raking it's in high billions on. of dollars yeah, yeah. on. The, this one up cat these, like, will imploding just, bankruptcy will, like, destroy railroads the climate. All around them. Oh, and yeah, meanwhile, like, it's yeah, like I mean, one guy in a seersucker suit being like, oh. And you know. all of it just going out from Norfolk, Virginia. <laughs> yeah. Well, they had a they had a cheat code, which is because the coal was all for export, there were no rate regulations. So they could charge anything they wanted. <laughs> oh, God, I did not know that part. <laughs> <laughs> that ma- that explains a lot. Yes. Oh, God, um, these bastards. <laughs> So anyway, the Penn Central Railroad fails. It takes every other Northeast Railroad with it. They become, they're nationalized and they become Conrail, right? And after deregulation and rationalization of some of the railroad, as well as massive cuts to the network in general, Conrail is returned to profitability and then denationalized. See, we um, did that in like 10 sentences. Took us like yeah, we two could've, minutes. We could have, but yeah. we weren't going <laughs> to. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this sort of field was narrowing, you know, these railroads that were previously considered huge, like the Chesapeake and Ohio or the Baltimore and Ohio, they were merging, creating strange new companies with names like CSX. Yeah. Right? Chessy system 10. Yeah. The most soulless corporate railroad name I can think of. Like, bring back it doesn't even cat. mean anything. Bring it back. Yeah. Yeah. Bring the cat back. Uh, so the Norfolk and Western and the Southern Railway counter with their own merger in 1982, creating Norfolk Southern, uh, Norfolk. According, to the, according to the unveiling of the signage at the new headquarters of the day of the merger. <laughs> <laughs> so they had, they had to fix that and call it Norfolk Southern the next day. Um, you know, and then Conrail was divided up and sold in 1999 with most of the former New York Central lines going to CSX, most of the former Pennsylvania lines going to Norfolk Southern. And this is how uh, Norfolk Southern comes to own tracks in East Palestine, originally built by the Pennsylvania Railroad. And anyway, that's the direct line from the Heightstown derailment to today. Very good. Ironically, (laughs) like they've turned around and owned the owner that owned them. Like now they own the Pennsylvania Railroad. Yeah, so this is how we get our beloved haunts. Yes, this is how the haunts uh, comes to cause us grief and misery. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Writing a pale haunts. So, um, anyway, that's the history. Now we'll talk about some of the technology, uh, railroad technology that causes mm. derailments like this. Yeah. Uh, bearings. All right, the, thing, the the spinny thing that the axle spins inside, right? Yeah, the 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 spinny the part where the spinny thing meets the not spinny thing, oh, right? Okay. Um, so in 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 railroading, there's basically two types of bearing. There's a roller bearing and there's a plane bearing, right? Um, now in the early days of railroading, and until not too long ago, a lot of bearings were plane bearings you can see here it's just an axle that rotates in a shaft right and mm-hmm. then there's oily rags underneath oh so there are gross. oil yeah nice that oil the bearing Ooh. <laughs> like just awful it's delicious so, oily like, rags they cause so many deer almonds like there there's like a couple where like Vietnam war bombs are being shipped on like Southern Pacific and California and they catch on fire. And then from a hot box and the train explodes cause it's filled with bombs, literal bombs. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> like I think that happened three times at least during the peak of Vietnam. Cause all those bombs had to go to the ports somehow. Jesus so, fuck. Yeah. It was a total nightmare. Again, the fact that roller bearings it hadn't replaced these cars in, you know, Western railroads had the money. They're just being cheap bastards. But, yeah. Sorry. For yeah. It's, out. it's, it's bad news when one of these things catches fire because you've got all the fuel in the form of the oily rags. Um, you got friction, which is adding to the heat because of, um, you know, the train's rotating, this, or, but the, 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 the wheel is rotating, not the whole train. That would be bad. The train starts rotating later when the 
when the bearing fails. <laughs> um, but so, so, so like you can you can start a fire with just the friction from the axle, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so it spins too fast. It isn't like lubricated enough, and you set fire to the oily let me rags. See this 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 condition here. This is a hot box. That's when the the bearing overheats to the point where it's on fire. Not um, the fun kind of hot box. Yeah, no, this the is bad the kind. Particularly bad problem because owing to the fact that friction causes the fire, it's more likely to happen at high speeds than low speeds. Um, mm. So all the derailments caused by these failed bearings are very nasty. <laughs> yeah, up to a speed of like twenty miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so in the nineteen thirties, um, especially in the thirties, I think maybe even slightly earlier, um. This this company Timken started marketing uh, roller bearings to railroads. Um, so rather than having just the shaft spinning in the the thing, now we have all these rollers that make contact between the inside and the outside of the bearing. That significantly reduces friction. That means everything runs nicer. There's much less chance of problems. Uh, you know, hot boxes are sort of all but eliminated just through this technology. Yeah, we fixed um, it. And it, it yeah. even looks cooler, too. I mean, yes. It's better in every possible way. Lower friction. You, doesn't, you don't have to spend as much fuel pulling your train. It's easier <coughs> this is... to switch the cars. They but fail have, less. Have you considered what this is going to do to America's burgeoning oily rags industry? <laughs> <laughs> Drive it deep underground yeah. into some sort of black market? I'm not really sure. <laughs> Yeah, there's so many jobs in like oily rags, and you know, we're just you want to destroy it. Uh huh. Uh -huh. American manufacturing is built on oily rags. And think of all the random, you know, people have to go put out the tie fires that these cause, you know, all mm -hmm. will be put out of out of their good, well paying jobs. It's like when they do the uh, oh, the the dot, we can't ban, we can't allow marijuana because then the drug sniffing dogs won't have a, uh, uh, a job. job. So, uh, uh, Timken and a few other companies pretty aggressively market this technology, but it's not fully adopted until really the 1990s, I want to say. Is oh, hold hold on, you said World the 30s. War. What happened in the other 60 years? World War uh, II. No one, no, no one felt like upgrading the bearings. You get a lot of railroads who... World War II went on for a long time. Yeah. ...who convert very quickly, <laughs> like a lot of the Western railroads who are not financially imploding kind of convert everything within 20 odd years but uh the problem is it just takes one of them to fuck up your train and mm. you have a lot of stragglers especially like with how penn central explodes and everyone yeah. around that so it's a definitely a problem that persists well, I know there's that like that. you, there's a shit ton of like um, lead time in like how often rolling stock gets changed and stuff, and there's still stuff rolling around from like I don't know caveman times or whatever, where like you have yeah. to put your feet through the floor and like pedal it. But like, this seems like such a gimme. Like it saves money. Why? Like, you gotta have money to save institutional money. <laughs> so, inertia. Uh huh. Uh huh. And plus, you might have a car that's like nearing the end of its life, and you don't really want to upgrade it. But, At you know, some the, point, though, the feds had to have been like, there were governments in those 60 years who wanted to regulate things. How come nobody was like, no, you got to use these? I don't, I do not believe, uh, I, there was, I'm not even sure if it's an actual regulation or just an ARA rule. Um, I mean, I, the only time you really saw a conventional rag bearings by the 90s, at least where I'm more familiar out west, uh, mm. it's usually on maintenance away equipment because yeah. that stayed internal. So if the if you had like equipment that you know ballast cars or just stuff to move around your own railroads track maintenance stuff, they're allowed to go past the 50 year lifespan. So some of the ballast cars I worked with were you know about as old as my grandpa. Jesus, <laughs> good so, lord. I mean, and they don't do much. They just kind of sit around a lot of the time. So they last forever and they were overbuilt because they're built during World War II or right after it. So, you know, sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll be put on newer wheels, but mm. usually only when the other ones fail because they just got old and ancient. But 
Okay, there's no federal regulation on plane bearings, but Association of American Railroads has banned them from interchange service as of 1991. Um, and I think that was shortly after the Mississauga derailment, which was caused by a plane bearing car. Um, you know, yeah, I think so, some of the Canadians were some of the ones dragging their, like, dragging on this one, too. Yeah, there's always weird stuff going on up there. So anyway... Um, this problem, hot boxes, it was a big problem for a while. That's why we had things like cabooses on trains, right? So some guy could look out over the whole train. I believe train. you mean cabooses. Cabooses, yes. Cabooses. Excuse me, cabooses. Um, you know, you had cabooses. You had a guy who could look out over the whole train. And if he looked ahead and saw, hmm, train's on fire. Seems bad. And he could, you know, send the signal to stop the train, right? Um, so... You know, that was the old method for detecting these hot boxes. But then again, we get the roller bearings that makes hot boxes almost unheard of. But they still happen. You can still have problems with the bearings. Yeah, but you can't like we... still have cabis because you've got to employ a guy and we don't want to do that anymore. Don't want to do that. Yeah. So you, you, you come up with line side detection equipment, uh, the defect detector. One of the funny things is that the cabooses were some of the, or cabis, were some of the last pieces of equipment to get roller bearings because they didn't interchange. And uh, so ironically, <laughs> some of the last ones were really like that kind of equipment. So <laughs> the hot really... box is coming from inside the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This will be this, my slide. This is you, Brian. Tell, tell me All about right. these. So <laughs> detectors, you have a whole wide range of them. And on routes like the train, the N30, was it N32? The, uh, yeah, or it was 32N, yeah. I forget. 32N, my bad. Uh, this is the old Pennsylvania main line. So <laughs> they had a lot of detectors. Uh, one thing you see with railroads is they often do invest in their main lines which like norfolk southern did here but uh detectors often you know you won't see as many on on branch lines so that's mm -hmm. what kind of like makes this worse is that there was a lot of detectors on this trackage but the types of detectors you have are like uh you have like here you can see what looks like a a bearing and axle measurement uh, like, so this is like a hotbox detector, but you have all sorts of detectors that do like dragging equipment. They'll have these little flanges, like kind of like sheets of metal that stick up that can shatter if something hits it. If it's dragging, you have detectors for gauge that are, some of them are very basic. Like you had somewhere, they just kind of had rods that sticked out. And if it hit the train, uh, they would, it would tell you to stop <laughs> in various different ways you like had... strung a triangle up over it you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> you have like falling rock detectors where it's just a bunch of wire next to the track and let, looks like a fence and if something breaks the wire it trips and tells you and you have like sometimes some railroads invest enough to where these have automatic train stop and others just you know it yells at you on the radio some of them a dude has to see that it went off and then radio you so there's like human failure points between these mm. uh you get like high water detectors which i mean that one's kind of a given water's too high like uh where i worked we had a lot for uh even though i was usually in the desert if you had high water uh from like a, a rain from flooding you'd get like a signal indication to tell you to stop uh and then you have like acoustic, some of the more modern systems, you have like acoustic bearing sensors where they will like try and use signal analysis to figure out what's going on. And a lot of those are less for like uh, emergency <coughs> situations like this, what happened in East Palestine. But uh, your big one is the hot axle and hot bearing detector, which is a hot box detector. Mm. Uh, the Norfolk are you on Southern fire detector? About every 20 miles. Uh, where I worked, we had them, they varied a lot, like in mountain territory, they'd be usually every five to 10. And then once you're out in the plains, you know, they would space them out to 20 to 30 miles. But, <clears throat> and this thing, it literally, it like 
looks at the train to determine whether or not the bearing's on fire, right? Yeah, it's just mm. like a very dumb, does it see a very big differential in temperature? And if it does, it yells at you. Mm. And, sure. uh, <laughs> and it'll do like, I, like I put in the notes, it'll be like, CSX equipment defect detector, mile post, zero, 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 what an, no defects. Yeah, yeah. So like Microsoft, Microsoft Sam will yell at you yeah, to be like, yeah, 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 yeah. God, they got so annoying. Like so, like when <laughs> they replace I was working it with the TikTok text to speech <laughs> voice. Uh, you know, if you're working on track, you know, you have the radio playing over the section section truck. So every train that passes, we would hear this over and over and over. Oh, that <laughs> it just sounds got horrible. Annoying, which Norfolk and Southern, uh, or Norfolk Southern, uh turned that off which is something that had been talked about a lot in the aftermath of this that some railroads and some divisions where there's a lot of traffic opted to have not all of the detectors play back a message if there was nothing particularly wrong and that was because it's just so damn annoying I mean, and that makes sense it, if it's like if it's yeah. like failing safe if it's reporting that everything's fine why do you need to hear it sort of thing you know Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then you introduce a human failure point. So now that it's not telling you unless it's a critical situation, it's not telling you when it's kind of bad. Mm. And now you've inserted a person who, you know, on a Friday night might not be all the way up to, you know, might not be having a great time working their just job at a Friday night, and yeah, they have us. to monitor. <laughs> hundreds of these detectors it's coming through on like an excel shed spreadsheet and their job is to monitor that and then to relay to a crew if they think something's getting worse and that's a big part of what led to this so like it, you just there's so many different spots where human putting a human into this decision tree is bad <laughs> <laughs> Like, you want the machine to yell at you every time you go over it, but it's annoying. And I, all the railroads have their own special rules about when the yep. defect detector should go off and when it shouldn't, mm -hmm. when it gets radioed to the office and when it gets radioed to the crew. There's no, like, federal regulations about this. Much Is there like, any rhyme or reason behind this? Like, It's kind of like uh, the feds were like, oh, hey, we love that you're doing this. Uh, we think you're doing a good job. Uh, we view this tech as great. Um, we think it's in your interest to make sure you do it right because the train on the ground is expensive. And because it didn't cause too many particularly bad derailments, it never got momentum to get regulated. So. Will it now? Or like. Oh, no, maybe. Yes. <laughs> yeah. maybe. One of the proposed pieces of legislation by Fetterman, and I can't remember. I think it was Marco Rubio. Uh, their proposed bill from the Senate actually did consider some regulations for these, which would be great. The FRA, just like one thing about the FRA is there's like 10 guys. They just don't have enough people to like verify all of this. So, so much of railroad yeah. regulation. An ex who works for the Federal handled. Railroad Administration, the most <laughs> overworked woman I have known in my entire life. Oh, no. Yeah. So they have to rely on the railroads to actually police themselves. They just don't have enough people. They don't have enough money. Uh, and so, like, there's a lot of talk about on the media from, like, well, why didn't Pete do more about this and that? And it's like uh, the structure is very much rigged against anyone doing good here because yeah. they just don't have much to work with. Sure. And the FRA is just, you know, the 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 the... They they eviscerated the safety portion of the Interstate Commerce Commission and like put it into Department of Transportation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like uh, it was never it, it, it was it was it it's a bizarre agency um, just in its history and like, you know, and this is how, like a regulatory capture deal as well. On top of that, I assume yeah. mm -hmm. what you said. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's regulatory capture. And it's also just like they don't have a choice that they, they right. have to rely on the AAR to like get the railroads to self-regulate and sometimes it works but this is a very glaring example as, when it didn't as we'll see yeah 
Um, what else should we talk about? How about vinyl chloride? Ooh, chemistry lesson. Yeah. All right. What's a uh, vinyl chloride? It's um, uh, it's a little molecule you see there. Looks a little yes. bit like one of those balloon animals. It's a monomer. Okay, it's I don't know how many girlfriends it has. I, it's yep. a thermoset <laughs> yeah. plastic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's got it. It's got three H's. It's got one CL. It's got two carbons with a double bond, right? Um, and it's a predecessor chemical to polyvinyl chloride, i.e., oh, PVC. Oh, that thing and everything. Yeah. Yes. And that is it's... a polymer, which is a bunch of monomers stuck together. Cool. I love uh, plastics. Way of the future. Yes. The, exactly. Possibly the last detectable fragment of human existence, aside from maybe like the Voyager probes. Yeah. Yeah. Like a uh, thin, sort fuck. of like, like a microscopic layer of like plastic fishing gear or something in a fossil record. Uh, is, and that's going to be us. Yeah. It's so one of those polymers that uh, whenever it, you actually make it, like instead of, unlike polyethylene, which is like your water bottles and stuff like that. Uh, when it's formed, it's formed through a thermoset reaction, so it can't be recycled. It's just being formed once. Forever correctly. chemicals. So Whoa. it's making... It's not too bad. The worst thing is somehow lead ends up in PVC for ductility. It's one of those engineering derogatory moments where, uh, <laughs> you know... Because I studied mechanical engineering, and, you know, like... We would, you know, lead's one of those great materials as long as it doesn't touch people, because <laughs> it <laughs> makes working with the material so much easier. Uh, and so that's a forbidden fruit of uh, material <laughs> science. There. <laughs> I just want to use lead. I just want to use asbestos. <laughs> Bring it back. <laughs> is is so good. It, like this it is, is me so making good pads. at thermal protection. Yeah. Just, I want stuff to be workable be in the hand ever. and not be on fire. <laughs> And uh, so long as no humans are involved, we've solved this perfectly. Just don't yeah. put it in, you know, something like a ship where it has to be removed every couple decades. And then, you know, you have the mesothelioma, yeah. like commercials for all that. One uh, of those things, it's like fossil fuels. The big problem with them is that they're really good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> it's so hard to beat just how good oil is at everything it does it's we discovered the best awful thing <laughs> yeah so like it, yeah so so pvc is most commonly used uh plastic and things like pipes insulation records siding so uh, like I, this has been a, a production of the plastic council where would yes. we be without pvc you, you uh, can use it in like mm -hmm. fucking everything sexy clothing uh yes <laughs> insulation Jesus uh, yeah third thing yeah. a third secret <laughs> thing yeah uh -huh. so now PVC itself is extremely safe but vinyl chloride is not it's a really nasty chemical um yeah, the plastic industry you know has some some horrible shit there oh uh, yeah think like Coming from a Houstonian, where most of our traffic is this kind of shit in Houston, uh, this is kind of about the midway level of oh god, oh fuck to like inert cargo. This is about middle of the pack. Uh, it gets a lot worse than vinyl chloride. Yeah, you're not moving like sort of like chemical industry shit. You're not like you know a big tank full of dioxin or fertilizer or whatever. But like, like molten sulfur. <laughs> Yeah. Well, molten sulfur is not too bad. It, it won't, like, <laughs> vaporize oh, what you sentence. or anything. Sentences from the railroad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have some context. My family all worked in oil. So, like, you know, I'm used to a lot of this stuff. But, like, uh, it's... There is so much worse. <laughs> like, you know, you get your, like, what is it, buric acid? Like, Ooh, and they come yeah. in these tiny little tanker cars. They're just little demon tanker cars. Like, I'll have to share a photo for the pod one edited later. They are yeah. tiny. Like, they're only 10, 15 feet long. And uh, it's just like, if this they're breaks, like apocalypse they're gone. Puppy. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is it, like butyric acid, you said? 
Yeah, or something like that. There's just so many of them. Like, uh, <laughs> the smaller the tanker car, unless it's corn syrup, the more evil and awful it is. <laughs> corn syrup's also kind of evil and awful. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, but... <laughs> In different ways. And I had to work a derailment with corn, empty corn syrup cars, and thank God they were empty, because uh, one of the worst Throw things away three is pairs of boots. all the insects get into that stuff, oh. and you're working a derailment. Like, uh, some of the stories I heard from guys who would work on the grain lines, where if a grain train derails, and if, say, back in the day, they would bury the cars, uh, say back in the day, till like the 2000s, uh, you know, you're just putting a whole, you know, 100 tons of grain in the ground and it starts to ferment. And if you didn't do a great job of burying it, animals get into that. So you'll just get drunk deer, the <laughs> moose, everything like <laughs> terrorizing the local town because the railroad was too cheap and just buried it. <laughs> <laughs> So there's all sorts of, you know, that's on the less harmful end, but, you know, you also, for like, until the EPA exists, you know, vinyl chloride was moved before then. If they had a derailment, they just buried these tanker cars along the track. Like, cool. The tracks in a lot of places just have a graveyard of every awful chemical you can think of. And uh, that's one thing about a lot of railroad track. Like, yeah, the creosote ties are bad, but like, it's everything is in that track. It's been there for a hundred plus years and most of that before the EPA was a thing. So just hey, the, every the, nightmare chemical you can think of. DDT, that was moved by tanker cars. So there's DDT. Right, at, at, at least there's not everywhere. like a constant mix of like dirt and brake dust and grime and like, you oh, know, yeah, small metal too. particulates just floating around in the air carrying you know all of this shit around as well. Congratulations, Petra. you've just described chewing tobacco. Yeah. <laughs> Tetraethyl lead that was moved around in tanker Ooh, cars. Oh yeah. Was it? Oh boy. Yeah, <laughs> at uh, thirty thousand gallons at a time. Yeah, at least that like Ooh. smells good. Because that's another great uh, thing about right lead. Lead makes you lead, stupid. Yeah, lead moves <laughs> like like lead helps to make stuff like very sort of like um uh, what's the word like easily workable. Also, like smells and tastes amazing. Sweet apparently. Yeah. Um. Uh, there may uh, be some downsides to it. I'm not sure. No, Maybe, no, yeah, no, 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 no downsides. Bring back leaded gasoline. Fuck it. So, <laughs> so your your vinyl sorry. chloride here is um you know it's it's very flammable. Its flash point is at negative 108 degrees Fahrenheit, yeah. or negative 78 degrees Celsius. But doesn't <laughs> it usually get hotter than that in most of the world? Yes, perhaps. Um. It's heavier than air as a gas, and thus it forms a cloud that hugs the ground closely. It also gives you cancers. Um, when it burns, it creates hydrogen chloride gas and carbon monoxide and trace amounts of phosgene, which you may remember from <laughs> World War I. Yes. Yeah, the, the silent killer. <laughs> yeah. And, like, one of the things with this stuff is that if you can, uh, you don't move it. You 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 synthesize it on site at the plastic plant, uh, you, from like the less dangerous predecessor chemicals, which is ethylene and chlorine gas. But uh, cool, the less dangerous stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, chlorine's the less dangerous one. That's uh, that's another fun well, one. <laughs> <laughs> but when you do have to move it, you use these uh, DOT one hundred five tank cars, right? Uh, here. Um, and this is a, you know, pressurized tank car with insulation, right? Um, unfortunately they have to use glass wool instead of asbestos because, you know, can't use the good stuff. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Can't use the good stuff. <laughs> um, you know, but then you can move it as a pressurized liquid, right? Um, now there's risks that still exist, right? You, you, if you have an overheated car, the chemical can self-polymerize, right? And that sort of yep. causes pressure to increase, which eventually leads to an explosion. Um, or if you like just, breach this insulation or pressure in any way at all. Um, yeah. 
it's a not great time. Or if the safety valve gets stuck. Uh huh. Um, and again, the bearings on these cars. Um, well, oh, these so these all have roller bearings. They get <laughs> okay, roller cool. bearings. That Thank God. Usually okay. maintain pretty damn well because they make so much money that it's hard not to. Uh, like a lot of the oil companies. I mean, th I think this one was owned by a smaller operation, but you know, like Exxon, Chevron, they all have fleets of several thousand tanker cars, and uh, you know, they usually usually do pretty good job on maintaining them just because there's just so much money that like even if you're a greedy bastard it's hard not to but uh okay cool well, with podcast chemicals over. With smaller <laughs> chemical companies is where you get like the smaller operations where they start it's kind of like fracking companies where they start cutting corners because they're they could just get away with it under the radar because you know they might own 10 tanker cars or something like that and mm. uh, you get that, but much worse when it's not hazmat, which is what we'll talk about later, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and you have, uh, you know, if you have a, a, a boutique chemical company that makes the most horrifying chemical that you know that, that you can even think of. And of course, they don't have the money. Horrors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they don't have the money to uh, fix mm -hmm. the bearings. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, now that we're an hour and 11 minutes in, the derailment. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, way back in early February, America was fixated on the military's efforts to pop a Chinese balloon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which they eventually did. Yeah. Um, and took a selfie with it. At, at a cost <laughs> of, you know, who knows how many hundred thousand Don't dollars. worry yeah. about it. Yeah, uh, oh. the selfie was worth it. I'll say that's dude's rock moment with the budget. I'll, I'll, I'll be okay with that. Line item, dude's rocking. <laughs> rocking, comma, dudes. Eh, I feel like you could have done it cheaper. <laughs> could have just flown the plane through it. That probably would work. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, the only thing they had that could fly that high was a U two, and um, like th those things just crash if you look at them wrong so flying yeah. one through a balloon i feel like you're just like you're you're asking like gary powers yourself into montana you know <laughs> yeah I guess and they might not give you. up the pilot either I, they're fucking weird <laughs> up there <laughs> so uh, norfolk southern train 32n left madison yard near st louis which was bound for conway yard which is near pittsburgh right there's 151 cars long 9,300 feet long and weighed 18,000 tons. Yeah, small uh, beans. And it was uh, an arduous journey, like a lot of trains' journeys are today. So, for instance, the train broke in half at Attica, Indiana, right? It just did. On, on purpose? Okay. So. No, it, it, it broke. What's well, uh, better than one train? Two trains. Yes. Indiana's pretty flat. Yeah. Like, how? It, I understand there was a slight grade there to go down to a river and then back up. I mean, coming from the West, where we had pretty gnarly grades and still didn't break our trains, it, it's... Yeah, anytime I look at the Eastern Railroads, I don't know how they're doing anything and not imploding, <laughs> but... <laughs> um, Just how? Its crew timed out before reaching their terminal at Peru, Indiana. <coughs> and the that was train great. Was... So a bunch of guys have to like go out in a pickup truck in the middle of the night from a motel. Yeah, right. Yeah, driven by the most insane contractor in a Dodge caravan. Oh uh, boy! <laughs> to, to like put this train that has broken in half back together. Like the crew vans are wild. I have never seen someone off road a bone stock like Dodge caravan any better. It's like one of the vans. <laughs> just insane with them. Like and I, I would be in my like F three fifty like maintenance away truck. I'd get out of the way because they were not fucking around. <laughs> so, what? <laughs> <laughs> and like every time, like they were just like, oh god, they were crazy. That that whole thing. That's like another one of those like railroad kind of. Oh hey, this is an union job, so we can just export this, like you know Do whatever the fuck we want. This. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. 
We've gotten Yeesh. all of the guys who grew up playing like Crazy Taxi, and we have handed yeah. them <laughs> right. a Dodge yeah, worst caravan. Uber driver would feel like, you know, you're a limousine driver compared to one of these, like, <laughs> like adult life. <laughs> <laughs> So this train was also uh, poorly made up, right? It had the heaviest cars in the back of the train, which made it hard to handle. Um, So, uh, yeah, according to Railway Workers United, more than 40% of the weight of the train was on the rear one-third, right? And they had a bunch of... These heavy tank cars are full of fluid sloshing around. That's amplifying forces. These were placed adjacent to some cushioned cars, which is where... The drawbar, which is the part of the train that has the uh, coupler on it, um, the drawbar can move independently of the rail car, uh, which increases the slack in the train, and that amplifies forces even further. Right? You just do the free surface effect to yourself. Like, yes. Cool. Okay. I guess, like, one thing to mention here too is that a a, a railroad that is co-owned by all the other railroads in St. Louis, was the one who built the train, the uh, St. Louis Terminal Railroad. Yes. And it's kind of one of those cursed situations where usually these terminal railroads are pretty good because at, at like, for like on a macro level policy for like, oh, you know, when I get more freight on the rails. But where you get the bad situation is because they're owned by the class ones. You know, you get the same incentives like with PSR. You know, the in Norfolk Southern, Union Pacific, and others will kind of make they'll rush these crews because you know Ugh. they have to get it out, and their you know their owners are the class ones. So you get poorly assembled trains, and then NS accepted this train and accepted it as is, and didn't change it. Yeah, and 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 before. Precision scheduled railroading, you try and block this train for better train handling. You put the heavy cars in the front and the light cars in the rear. But with PSR, you need the shorter dwell times and rail yards. So this train is blocked in such a way it can be assembled and disassembled as quickly as possible, which is why, you know, the whole thing, the whole thing was a mess. Um, That's how it, you know, that's how you pull apart in mm, Indiana. (laughs) But like, not the impression I get, not an unusual mess. Like, yeah. It it seems like there's like a bunch of trains like this all the time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which Especially is why why we've got the like... derailment of the week thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. The class ones are messing up their yards, but you know, when you're a small railroad that's running a very expensive yard, you don't have the money to fix your yard for PSR. So it's just the same issue as the class ones, but compounded to be worse. And you don't, because so you, you can't smaller. sort of spread it out. Am I yeah, correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like it, these yards were never built for these kind of trains hmm. and uh, it's just getting significantly worse. Like coming from the West, like, you know, we had areas where we were extending, adding like 5,000 feet to some yards uh, of track and stuff like that. But in, Kind of like the mess, the spaghetti mess that is East St. Louis. There's nowhere really to do that. Uh, you can't really make any of these yards bigger. So it's just an awful situation all around. That sounds fucking horrible. <laughs> so uh, despite this, you know, uh, 32N makes it most of the way through its journey. Um, and this train was what's called a key train, right? which is a train that carries more than five cars of specified hazardous material, so it was limited to 50 miles an hour. Um, and as it was approaching the Pennsylvania border, um, we, get shit this, himself. Yeah, we get this lovely surveillance image here where we can say, that doesn't look good. Yeah, that looks like. Uh, a... I don't know what you're talking about. Fire. That looks fine, dude. <laughs> it's oh, look, look how small the fire is, and think how long the train is. What's good the problem? Point. That's a good point. I'm, Only a I'm, very small part of the train is on fire. I'm deliberately <laughs> ignoring the <laughs> massive black smoke cloud on the on the, on the image. Zero point zero 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 one percent of the train is currently on fire. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what's the fucking problem? 
To give like, kind of further over. context on a situation like this, if this was like a Thursday, there's a very solid chance someone would have been around to see this. Uh, you know, you finally get to the weekend. Everyone who's out there doing track maintenance or single signal work or anything like that on this busy main line, you know, they're trying to get out of work by like three or four if they can. Because mm. uh, if you're like a maintenance person, you generally have better weekends than the train crews. So, you know, we're, we would be the extra set of eyes and we would call in issues whenever, you know, you see them. But on a Friday night, they aren't there. So you've lost more of your kind of safety nets on top of the detectors having issues and all that. So like a lot, a couple of the DRM ones I worked were all Friday night ones. So. Hmm. <laughs> Just trying to go to the bar. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Like I had two on Easter weekend cause the people were just trying to get home. Yeah. Uh, Fucking yeah. sucks. But uh, this, this uh, security camera footage was from, I believe, Salem, Ohio, which is about 20 miles from East Palestine. Um, and this train went over a defect detector with a pretty significant defect, mm -hmm. which was, for whatever reason, not relayed to the crew. Right. Does it ha and that has to go through a person? Yes. There's someone working a miserable Friday night desk job. Brutal. In and someone has Norfolk fucked up. Southern okay. does their headquarters for maintenance. And, you know, on a Friday night, you're probably not having a great time. Like, you're newer at your job because you're working a Friday night. Mm. You know, you might have just not caught this. But if, it, if it's, know like, on ratio. fire, on fire, there isn't any provision for that to be, like, automatic. Uh, I believe, should be. according to the NTSB, the detector recorded a much lower temperature than would be expected for the car being on fire. Mm. <laughs> so, Maybe it's, like, there slightly was misaimed. There's, like, snow on the ground. Yeah. I don't know. There was snow on the ground, yeah. So... You know, th this is this problem goes completely. It was not detected by the detector, which is the one job it has. Um, <laughs> oh, your one job. <laughs> yeah. And it continues merrily rolling on its way until it gets to the detector in East Palestine, which relays to the crew: the train is on fire. You should stop. And the crew which was three people. Uh, I believe there was engineer, conductor, and there was a trainee in there. Uh, the engineer starts applying the brakes to stop the train, but before any appreciable braking can happen, possibly before even the detector had finished telling him to put on the brakes, uh, the train derails. So is this sort of like a, as soon as they had the information available to them, they did what they could? Yes. And it just didn't yeah. matter. Sort of yeah. like uh, you're, 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 TikTok crash. text yeah. speech, you know, where yeah. it's like train on fight just on the ground. It's like yeah. someone telling you you're about okay. to get punched as the fist is landing in your face. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I okay. That sounds terrain, like it sucks. terrain. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. Bam. <laughs> and I'm on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> I ruined my weekend. <laughs> yeah, you'd really hate to my have like a ground, <laughs> a ground proximity warning bar. system I just wanted to for go to trains. The bar. <laughs> <laughs> just like and on the ground, it's like terrain. The train, the train did okay. derail next to a biker bar. Oh, thank so, God! You know, if if you wanted I mean, to go I, to the I, bar, the crew was fine, right? I I can say thank yeah. God, and not be yes, the crew was fine. Okay, he yes, flee into the biker bar. Yeah. It's a hideout. What's the problem? Yeah. So the um you know, so uh the first few cars of the train made it through fine, then there was a hopper car, the one we see here, that derailed, and then the rest of the train sort of slammed into it and piled up, right? Um a few cars full of hazmat derailed, including notably five cars of vinyl chloride. Which is um good, right? That's what I've heard. Yeah, it's, it's good. The, it's the shit we like, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good, good, good. Fucking Norfolk Southern. Um, now this, this, this fire why is it was, haunts anyway. Why is it because it has a haunts in the logo? You know, okay. a horse. Yeah, yeah. Well, how do we get from horse to haunts? You gotta not worry a Facebook about it. Group. Okay. 
Okay. <laughs> or no, a Facebook page, excuse me. Um it's it's dumb foamer shit. Um Okay. God. So No, you know what? Explain the whole thing, Roz. No. <laughs> <laughs> Explain the joke or else. Yeah. <laughs> so uh so these these there were several hazmat cars on the ground, leaking, stuff was on fire. Uh, the fire was very difficult to get under control. I think it burned for about four days. And over those four days, these these vinyl chloride cars, they're having some interesting chemical reactions in them, right? Uh, pressure and temperature is going up. And so folks who were in charge of the cleanup uh, were like, we got to do something about this. Sure. Uh, cause having an explosion would be extremely bad. Mm. Uh, you know, cause you would have, uh, you might have shrapnel thrown long distances. You might, you, you would have, you would have sort of an uncontrolled situation, um, in that case. So the decision was made to do a controlled burn of the vinyl chloride. About to have to do some cool shit. Uh, having worked derailments, kind of one of the things that a lot of, like, from outside the industry, a lot of people don't realize is that, uh, like, uh, when you have a derailment, it basically becomes, like, this all-hands-on-deck. You, you're calling every contractor. They're like a coiled spring, ready to just, <coughs> I mean, they're vultures, really, but, like, <laughs> they're ready to just, just destroy everything and get the track back. And, uh, like, they're not usually used to these kind of hazmat derailments. Like, some of them are used to it, but, like, on the Gulf Coast, where we have a lot of this kind of stuff. But, yeah, it, it's kind of hard. Like, a lot of people are talking about how the track got restored before they did anything. It's just, like, it's such a, like, you know... It's almost like, oh, okay, you know, Folda Gap has happened. You know, it's DEFCON 1. That's like how these kind of things work. You don't think there's a lot of decision points. And then half of the management the whole time is trying to figure out who's at fault so their department doesn't get railed by uh, budget cuts or uh, getting having to pay for it. So, you know, uh, from track, you know, we would have one guy out there making sure the actual derailment's being cleaned up and fixed, but there's a four or five other track inspectors and management out there desperately combing over every piece of track to look for a reason that we can say it wasn't our fault. <laughs> and to run trains past it. it. It's yeah. almost like the Chernobyl kind of like everyone is looking for a reason to not be at fault. You know, the mechanical department guys are out there taking photo. You know, I would be out there taking a photo of every wheel, every flange I could find everything. And it's all going to go in a big, giant derailment report, and it's all a rat race to figure out who's screwed. <laughs> and meanwhile, Holcher is just chopping up every car uh, that derailed, or try, you know, mm -hmm. attempting to handle all the firefighting stuff. And, and at the same time, the state regulatory stuff, they don't show up. Like these people are generally like they have agreements with the railroads to like of expectations and the contractors and they kind of expect you to do the right thing because they kind of again they don't have the manpower and like, like resources to actually go to every single derailment unless it's bad like this one. So yeah, derailments Jeez, are that's wild. That's grim. Yeah, uh, yeah. I assume there's some sort of public pressure component to this and like on this main line this is the norfolk southern main line like yeah. there is immense pressure from every little layer of management above you to get this goddamn track back in service and uh if you don't you know that that's your head and most of our derailments we would get a lot of ours cleaned up in 24 hours uh even if the track wasn't that important to be honest. So, you know, like there's so times just absolute where, like, crisis response. Yeah. Like I, like I ordered like $10 million of ballast from halfway across the state because, you know, we didn't have it close enough. And right. like, you know, they didn't even use the track for a whole two days. It drove me insane. 
<laughs> Those fucking idiots. <laughs> So uh, it's just like railroads are so cool, man. <laughs> it's amazing they can do this like so fast, but it's also because it's so there's so little decisions to actually be made. It's just they're a coiled spring, ready to just do it. Mm. But so they'll overlook things that are outside of the norm of a derailment. And cool how this is like in like, like wartime conditions, you know? Yes, right. like, and a lot of these people are all ex-military, like. A lot of your management are ex army officers or something like that. Like th that persists that attitude. So you have mm. a lot of people who are looking at this as like a situation to be solved. And, you know, most of them don't know what the hell vinyl chloride is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we got these tank cars lying on the ground, uh, temperatures increasing. Folks are like, okay, we got to do a controlled burn. We got to vent this chemical out. Mm. So they put shaped charges on the five cars. Yes. <laughs> Someone I give know it's me. horrible, but yes. <laughs> Someone give me a, like a Photoshop of the DOT car with like contact DRA bricks all over it. <laughs> <laughs> like contractors will just get this shit out of places you didn't like they have stuff that i would never assume they would have they always had just everything you just wouldn't think they would have to do these kind of crazy things so and this used to be something that was all inside the railroad but kind of got externalized like everything oh, we, we externalized yeah. the explosives guys cool yeah, okay. and, and like <laughs> The division I worked on, like, we had a contractor that would have the track panels all, like, strategically laid out for where derailments were common and or most important to be fixed and, like, piles of ballast ready to go. And, you know, like, all these materials set out. And one of the frustrating things is that we didn't do this ourselves. Uh, and that's kind of, like, one of the things that, like, not, this is pre-PSR, but, you know, it's like the cannibalizing of your state capacity mm. to do things and while the railroads still have a lot of that compared to other industries like it you know they're suffering from that too and so then some of the critical decision making also is lost to that because like most of the contractors they don't know what the fuck vinyl chloride is they hire someone to know that for them if that comes up yeah and they could be, you know, halfway across the country still before they're dealing with the firefighting and all that. Well, yeah, you have to, uh, you would call my mom who works at Chemtrack. Yeah. And, and then she would tell you what vinyl chloride is. <laughs> hey, Mrs. Like, Rosniak. <laughs> yeah, I'm knee deep in some shit I don't recognize. And there's a burning sensation. <laughs> <laughs> And like a lot of like the EPA and your state EPAs, they're not equipped for the type of time scale the railroads want to work with. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, my fix it by tomorrow, a, sort of thing. TCEQ, yeah. uh, TC whatever the Texas EPA one, it's like a commission instead of an agency or whatever. But like, uh, you know, their time scale is, you know, we got a couple months or years to work on this. The railroad wants that track back, you know, 48 hours at most. Uh, and it's unacceptable to to make it last any longer than that. So it's very hard for, especially in Ohio, you know, a state that isn't really known for its progressive politics or uh, funding of its EPA, mm. uh, outside of like places like Cleveland where they've done a lot of really good stuff with cleaning up the river and everything. You know, they don't have the capacity to oversight the railroads on this. Cool. So they blow this shit up. They blow this shit up, shit right? Up. After digging trenches next to the cars so the vinyl chloride liquid will pool in the trench as opposed to like mm. running off into creeks. Um, and we get this wonderful picture of when they these cars essentially, you know, there, there was essentially an explosion, but not in the same way that it would have happened if it were uncontrolled. You get this mm. massive plume of smoke that goes directly into an atmospheric inversion giving sort of the impression that there's just this giant mushroom cloud that's gone off. Um, it's that goddamn lake effect weather. Yeah. <laughs> cool, and it just like hangs over the town. Just like Ominous hangs over the town inversion. for a while, yeah. 
Scares the shit out of everyone. <laughs> if, For yeah, good reason, I might add. Definitely a choose your poison situation. Uh and I'm I, I don't know if the people involved could have really been equipped to make a better decision. Uh even though they should have. It's not like I, 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 it's I easy, see but like mm. yeah. I, I, I see in the notes here that it says in a situation where a thing is going to blow up, it's generally better to blow it up on your time than its time, which is yep. a good t-shirt yeah. for like EOD fans, you know? Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I don't think there was much else you could have done here, because if you wanted to somehow like cool down the cars, that might not work. If you wanted to somehow transfer the liquid to another vessel where it can be monitored, you have to get up next to this car that might blow up at any time and stick a pipe on there and then you have to figure out how to cool the car the the liquid sufficiently that it's not gonna you know vaporize and do something unexpected while you're transferring and i think this was basically once those cars are on the ground and they seem to be self-polymerizing this is about the only thing you can do um, yeah, it's, it's this or bigger boom yeah <laughs> cool so um, it could have been worse yeah, because <laughs> uh, I think I think if you want to transfer the vinyl chloride, you'd have to cool the whole car down to nine degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, I don't know how <laughs> East Palestine would have the resources, <laughs> the like, giant the chiller cups of water <laughs> right. or power to the do thing that. outside yeah. pen. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, it's Justin. Uh, so this is a commercial for the podcast that you're already listening to. Uh, people are annoyed by these, so let me get to the point. We have this thing called Patreon, right? The deal is you give us two bucks a month, and we give you an extra episode once a month. Uh, sometimes it's a little inconsistent, but, you know, it's two bucks. You get what you pay for. Um, it also gets you our full back catalog of bonus episodes, so you can learn about exciting topics like guns, pickup trucks, or pickup trucks with guns on them. The money we raise through Patreon goes to making sure that the only ad you hear on this podcast is this one. Anyway, that's something to consider if you have two bucks to spare each month. Uh, join at patreon.com forward slash WTYP pod. Do it if you want. Or don't. It's your decision, and we respect that. Back to the show. So, you know, and from this we get, you know, all these nasty reports of massive fish kills in the streams and creeks around the town. Uh, some people's chickens and pets uh, died. Uh, some mm -hmm. livestock uh, may have been affected. Uh, this was done with a two-mile evacuation zone around the uh, the site of the wreck. Um, you know, they had they had the whole town evacuated, of course, before they did this explosion. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but sort of since then, you know, a lot of people have been very paranoid to go back to the town because it's been horribly poisoned by the railroad. Um, yeah. And like it's impossible for you to like tell, and you know, as much as the EPA might be monitoring the air quality, it's like you can still like just psychogenically be very harmed by this. And that's not to say that you're like crazy or making it up, because I would be fucking psychogenically harmed. I would fucking and not want to go back to my house in this shit. Um, yeah, plus, you know, not to mention the very real possibility that you are being like materially harmed by it. Yeah, and indoor air quality can vary and stuff like that. And then yeah, yeah, <clears throat> there's all this speculation about what's the water supply like, especially if you have wells in the area. Uh, mm -hmm. You're not on the municipal supply. Um, you know, there's, there's I guess lots the, of... the, like there's no way for the government to like 100 percent reassure you about this or yes. really anything. But like, did there there's nothing they can say that would like make you not be frightened of this anymore. I think. And a lot of the chemical monitoring that. is being done by Norfolk Southern contractors. Um, cool. Yeah. Right. Well, one of the nice things about derailments in a cursed way is uh, the insurance money is good enough that usually they do a good job on that. But 
because they're hiring externally, but it, it varies. Uh, especially whenever the railroad's terrified of a regulatory response. So mm, they yes, might, they will hopefully do a better job than normal because out of fear of the state. <laughs> but uh, great. One thing, fucking, but, like, fucking great. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> touching the big like, bug thing. Like it's East afraid. Palestine you know? that's really cursed is, you know, this is in the core of the industrial Midwest. Like, uh, one thing with hard, that's very hard for testing for chemicals along track like this is it's already deeply contaminated. Like, cool. you don't really have a good baseline. How so it's going to be harder to tell how much of this was just this derailment or the last 150 years of being <laughs> in the triangle of chemical and steel industry. You, you have like and, made Liam so mad he has had to get up and walk <laughs> around. <laughs> you know, uh, you know you're gonna sorry, take I a... was reaching for a cable. Uh, my bad. Yeah, but uh, yeah. No, uh, Ted Kaczynski had the right idea is what I'm saying. You're I'm joking. To, That's you're, obviously you're, a fucking joke. You're gonna... Don't fucking yell at me in the comments. <laughs> fucking, oh, yeah, well, you can use your tear. Shut the fuck up, dude. Imagine them, uh, safe, you know, so. taking a core sample for uh, soil testing and accidentally drilling into another vinyl chloride tank car that was buried <laughs> there vinyl ninety chloride years all ago. The, way down. <laughs> <laughs> the DDT tanker car that was buried in like nineteen forty four or something, yeah. and then like, <laughs> and then hitting the bomb car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Call eight one one before you dig. Yeah, especially no in Ohio. one knows what's under there. No. <laughs> we have yeah our so our our soil surveys ran out in the 30s so whatever happens to you there is between you and god hey, the railroad actively doesn't want to know what's under its track yes. and uh the people who buried the stuff there take it with them to the grave so <laughs> <laughs> like pirate treasure but for like and, toxins. You know, sometimes it could be a corvette you know there are derailments because like when like, uh, one of the funny stories I heard from a lot of guys before they ate, like, 90s, you know, whenever there was an auto train derailment, you know, just 20 new Corvettes disappear. Yeah, sure, we crushed them and put them in the hole. Like we <laughs> 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 and, you know, it, you know, as long as everyone got a Corvette, you know, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> that is that is mutual aid, probably. <laughs> Yes, yeah. It's redistribution. And one of the worst things that happened was, uh, one of the tragic things is, is like every auto rack derailment, those cars all get crushed, even if they're brand new. If it, it the tiniest derailment, uh, because someone well, did a lawsuit say, yeah. where they were able to sue the railroad successfully by a railroad essentially had a, a whole agreement with employees could buy cars from derailments, and uh, someone in, who bought that car got in in a car accident and someone somehow fought a legal battle all the way back to the railroad saying it was their fault and uh now we just crush them all to be fair no it probably fun. was the railroad's fault i mean that's not crazy oh sure yeah, but it's basically it, like no no fun the allowed or anything i right, think it was yeah. like eight years after the railroad had sold it i don't know it felt like a stretch <laughs> but uh Maybe no it was like the allowed. wheels fell off or something <laughs> i don't know i don't know it, it's frustrating to see when you work a derailment perfectly good product often just to be crushed because that's the only way the insurance money will pay out so. most efficient yeah. system of yeah. resources allocation yeah. yeah now the good news about this derailment is of course uh our secretary of transportation uh pete Buttigieg, was immediately on site and in control of the situation Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Speaking of speaking of like former military officers, yeah, uh -huh. I was about to say, uh he he was not he was not on the scene. I don't believe he commented on it until like ten days later. Um, when when sort of like it got bad enough, that he was like, "Ooh, shit!" I mean, oh, in yeah, fairness, well, when when the media finally took notice, um, yeah, he was distracted by the balloon, like all of us. We we were all chasing that balloon across the United States. <laughs> One of the crazy things yeah. was like Pittsburgh's press had the derailment pinned on the right thing and everything like the same day as they blew up the train like, like four or five days in and then national media kind of and like with like online just had this like weird scatterbrained like response like a week later is it, yeah 
and, and I think one thing is like institutionally, like we're so you in the industry, we're so used to this being a thing no one talks about. I mean, I, I think only one of the derailments I ever worked was even in the news at all at like any level. And uh, only because it happened literally right in front of, you know, on a main road, like next to yeah. a main road. Mm-hmm. It, it's like it, this stuff is so out of sight and out of mind that it's like jarring how much people att- pay attention to derailments now. Like after yeah. it being like a, you know, who even cares or even aware of it. Uh, yeah, there, there was like some weird circumstances around the coverage. I mean, you know, because when it was burning for like four days, no one seemed to notice. They blew it up. No one noticed for another, again, a week. Yeah. And then, you know, all of a sudden this becomes front page news everywhere. Uh, I guess because they got the balloon, um, you know, and then then we then then a bunch of stupid stuff happens. Right. Yeah. Like, uh, Gov- Governor Mark DeWine or. Yeah. Is it Mark? Mike. Forget. Mike DeWine. Mike DeWine. Yes. Uh, he shows up two hours late for his own press conference. Right. And. A guy with a news uh, station tried to deliver a scheduled report from the cafeteria where the pressure was ongoing despite being told not to. And that guy got arrested and then they yeah. released them afterwards. But everyone's like, Stupid Oh my God, cops. they're, they're yeah, trying. This is like uh, American Stalinism begins now. Um, yeah. You know, they're it's trying like... to hide the fucking, you know, American Chernobyl. I, I did see that this, <laughs> some of this was apparently like deliberate Russian disinformation, which is like, Cool. Yeah. Okay. It's like sure. an easy layup, you know, to be I like. Mean, all you have to do is just boost a couple of accounts. Like, yeah. It's cheap. Yeah. Hey, it, it. What was crazy is just like everyone fucked up from the communication end for anyone outside of the town. Deeply fucked up because, like, I, like as much as like I don't think the head of the DOT has to comment on every derailment, but like. I'm kind of like whatever on Pete, but like it's such a sign of bad political vibe sense to like just Mm -hmm. not realize that like he seemed like he was in a paralysis about this. And he wanted to be president too. Like, yeah. Like oh, one of bad. the things that you have to do if you're if you're president is be ready to like say something when fucking like nine eleven two happens. Yeah. And you can't have handle like a, a little miniature nine yeah. eleven specific to your job. And like it's such a layup to rail on the railroads about it, but uh-huh. and they kind of just yeah, I didn't intend that one, but uh and like uh they just kind of let it go. And wow. Pete's whatever, it kind of is like, oh, maybe you shouldn't do go any further because, God, you have no sense of, like, timing or mm-hmm. messaging. Like, you kind of just let this layup go. Yeah. And, yeah. Meanwhile, Trump was out there, like, instantly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, like, everyone was, like, late. It was, like, what, three weeks later, I think, at that point? Yeah. And then Biden just never even went? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Biden's like fuck that. I'm going to Ireland. And then like <laughs> a normal Which dude's thing, rock, to be fair. Yeah, with like all these derailments, like the e- it's very normal for the EPA to order the cleanup, and so like at least they did that publicly, but they didn't talk about it enough. Like it's just bad politics. Yeah, and idiots. Yeah, a whole bunch of conspiracy theories seem to be sprouting up around the uh, the derailment, mm-hmm. right? Um, a lot of people, uh, especially initially were like, oh my God, this toxic gas cloud is going to affect people as far away as like Southern New York or like Tidewater, Virginia, which, uh, did not happen. Um, no, but it's, uh, again, with the like psychogenetic illness stuff, you know, you can, you can make yourself sick by worrying about it at least somewhat. And this is a, a very frightening thing. So, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's very, pr- it's like a, a, a like I said, it's a layup to just be like, this is proof that uh, America, which I'm spelling here with three Ks, has Chernobyled itself. And it's like, no, America does that in like tons of different ways all the time. But yeah. like... This is not especially n- special. No, so no, exactly. It's it's just eye-catching. Right. Yeah. And what do you do get, which is interesting, is this a lot more reporting on the sort of constant low rumble of derailments ever since, you know? Like, uh... Mm. You know, a locomotive falls over in like uh, 
Washington State, and all of a sudden this makes the news everywhere. And it's kind of like no one would have cared about that, uh, you know, 14 weeks ago. <laughs> That's probably yeah, a one, good like, thing. There was like one in Houston that week where it was like a week after when it got into the news, and it's like uh, diesel oil, like a hazmat spilled, and it's like the, it hit a truck. So yeah. the truck's fuel well, spilled, and it's like, yes. all right, people. Technically mm-hmm. hazmat. Um, it is hazmat, <laughs> yeah. but like all you got to do is put some cat litter out and you're done. Like it's not the worst <laughs> thing. <laughs> like, oh my I mean, God, people. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's good that people are noticing or care about like the destruction of American railroads, but like, uh, man, I also know they're just going to forget pretty quickly. And that's why it yeah. took us this yeah. long to sort of like get this one right. Yes. Right. Uh, there was one that kind of went well with the response. What was it BNSF put a train on the ground next to this one? Was that one that ran through that derail on a reservation? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we talked about this actually. Yeah. 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 And uh, they think so. BNSF, for some reason, foolishly, like, I don't, I don't know why they had ever agreed to this, like, from a railroad perspective, but they agreed to only move like 20 cars a day. To an oil refinery in like the 90s and then you know the fracking boom happens and uh now you're moving 100 car trains probably daily and uh now it's going through a whole court process because the reservation they violated the reservation agreement and the court signed like sided with them so we'll see how that goes yeah uh it's just crazy to see this like all like there's good things coming out of it now the the greater attention to derailments like that but uh also you get that like knee jerky like i'm almost sometimes worried like people will kind of think of it like chernobyl where it's like mm. become anti-rail and then <laughs> and then we ship everything via truck. trucks yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. which of course never have hazmat accidents like, you know houston's had chlorine truck like accidents before those are not fun uh don't want more hazmat <laughs> on the hey, roads. Hey, he just want to kill mm-hmm. like fifty families. <laughs> Talk about an actual yeah. like chemical weapon situation. A chlorine mm. truck just happening on the street. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like at least you have some kind of separation, like a, a sort of like semi-controlled environment, even if it is built on like five layers of DDT cars crashed on top of each other. <laughs> yeah. So, but one of the media reactions, which I, I think uh, was one of the weirdest, was very politicized, and one which I thought was just flat out wrong, is the break thing. Oh, We're going to talk about the break thing. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, Maybe I do need a beer at 10 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's, it's one of my favorite diagrams. It's the Westinghouse air break. Yes. Um, so there was uh, a certain the, media was outlet. out cock on there, and I yeah. get cheap heat by being like, "I'm trying." <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we there there was a lot of media attention to uh, America's quote Civil War era unquote braking system uh, that we use on trains, the Westinghouse air brake system. So why are we still using these Civil War era brakes? And um, I, I'm going to go full fud about this. Why am I still using a 1911? Because it works. Yeah, it's a right. solved. It's a solved problem. It's a solved <laughs> technology. This is as good as it's ever going to get. I only need eight rounds. Stopping power. Oh, stopping power. Wars. Stopping power. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, it's like this. This was a quote from I want to say Sarah Feinberg, who was the FRA chief back when Burlington Northern Santa Fe put a big uh, crude oil train on the ground. Uh, probably like 10 years back. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the thing here is, uh, why, you know, why are we trying to solve, you know, the COVID pandemic with a 19th century technology like vaccines, right? Why, yeah, 18th century, right? Like, 18th century, yeah. Uh, why are we using a Roman era alloy like steel, right? <laughs> why are we using Stone Age technology like wheels? Um you know, 
the the Westinghouse air brake is very simple. It's very reliable. It's basically fail safe. Each car has a cylinder of compressed air on it. Compressed air pipe runs the length of the train. A reduction in pressure in that main train air pipe triggers the cylinders on each car to put the brakes on. Owing to the physics, this happens sort of sequentially, car by car, right? This brake signal propagates at about the speed of sound down the length of the train, which for most purposes is fine. Um, you know, there's well, like some... the, the problem here wasn't that the train didn't stop quickly enough when they tried to stop it. It's that they didn't yeah. know to try and stop right, it quickly right. enough. It's pretty hard to stop a train when the wheels are not wheels yes. anymore. Yeah, yes. right. <laughs> well, I mean, it's stopping. I'll say that. Like, well, uh, well, it's, it's, it's litho breaking. Fashion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's there's some ways this brake system can fail, right? If you overuse the brakes, sometimes you bleed off enough air that it's hard to set the brakes again. If you if you're a um, single idiotic French man and you go and disable every brake down the length of your train, yes. uh, you could you could do that. Um, if you're sitting too long without power, the air will eventually bleed off and release the brakes. These are both known quantities which can be corrected for with good train handling and hand brakes. Um, now I ask you though, what improves every system and never has faults? Tobacco. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Tobacco. All right. Computers. What if we oh, added no. computers to this? Oh no, no you <laughs> motherfuckers. No. Thinking sand. <laughs> it, it, this is gonna be like the train equivalent of that movie The Net, where the, they fucking hack Sandra Bullock's yeah. car. What, like, and what would be better than just thinking sand? Thinking sand that talks to each other via radio signals. Yeah. Uh huh. Nope. Not even a, a no. hard line of copper. Oh, we, fuck yeah. yourself. We, we just not. did a whole episode about safety critical software engineering, and like, ah. Uh... <laughs> what a fun noise! So, ah. What is electronically controlled pneumatic brakes? I assume it's bad. Is it bad? Oh, we'll, we'll get to some ways it's bad. Oh, um, fucking horrific, <laughs> bud. So there was this push um, in a couple of outlets to say, okay, Pete Buttigieg has to do something. Uh, why not reinstate this braking safety rule that the Trump administration rejected? to mandate these new fancy electronically controlled pneumatic brake systems on hazardous materials trains. It may not have stopped this derailment, but it would have stopped other ones, right? Um, and so a lot of people ask like rhetorical questions, like why doesn't Pete move to do this, right? Why don't they do something, right? Why did the railroads want to adopt this technology before back in 2008? And they don't want to do it now. And, um, well, we're here to answer the rhetorical question. Uh, Yay for us. Put, yeah. put, put that in the t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> so the, um, the ECP system is very similar to the Westinghouse air brake system, except that rather than the brake signal being propagated by a change in air pressure, it's from a cable that goes down the length of the train. Right. Um, and then, the computer oh, system on each car. Bar shit. Yeah. Die by wire. No, yeah. thank you. <laughs> if it ain't Boeing, I ain't going. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry. About, don't worry about the seven three seven Max shit they just put out. <laughs> That's why I'm always in a seven forty seven. God's airplane. Yes. Right. <laughs> I bet God would fly in one of these. Yeah. Um, this means theoretically you have an instant response along the length of the train, as opposed to you know this sort of one car puts the brakes on the next one, the next one, the next one, so on and so forth. Right. Um, so now back in 2008, the railroads were all over this technology, right? It was sort of ostensibly for safety, but a big part of it is about labor productivity, right? I was going to say, I remember um, some other stuff that happened in 2008 and I think there may yeah. have been some financial imperatives acting on the railroads. Yeah. Well, so the railroads are making a killing in 2008. Yeah. Coal. Yeah. Coal. Uh, How to river shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So ECP braking involves adding this small microcontroller on each car that would be able to monitor vital information like the status of the brakes, 
varying temperatures, various other little bits and bobs where they're currently checked by hand. Um, that means fewer car inspections and fewer carmen required to do those inspections. Um, now, the railroads have since made all those labor productivity gains by simply telling the carmen to work harder, bitch. But uh, <laughs> God. Um, yeah, you, you go from doing two minute inspections to 90 seconds and it's like you could have an 89 foot Liam. long car. I'm good, I'm good. How the hell do you look at the whole car in 90 seconds? You can't well, even you walk, around well and and walk around and around. No, I'm sure it's fine. Um, you have an, uh, another couple benefits from the system, potentially, you know, in your conventional air brake system, you can't do a partial release of brakes, right? So if I, I'm coming down a hill and I realize I applied the brakes too hard, I can't back off gradually. I have to do a full release and then put the brakes back on. Um, an ECP system would be capable of like a partial release. Uh, ECP systems would lead to shorter stopping distances, theoretically and would prevent some kinds of derailments in emergency brake situation, theoretically. Um, see, and this is all very well and good, and in laboratory environments it worked very well, uh, but mm. uh, there was a big issue that was discovered during uh, when you actual apply field it testing. To like, when you apply it to the, the, the real environment of the infinite radial plane of Indiana. Yes. Right, yes. Uh, no, we must imagine a perfectly <laughs> spherical Indiana. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the problem was that when they tried it on actual trains in the wild. Um, in the wild. <laughs> none, oh. none of it worked. Um, and really? in fact, okay. there was a whole lot of weird problems that developed with these systems, right? So one of the Is most like an common interference issue or like there was an interference issue. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. Love that Which shit. Is, which is that on test trains, if you had two ECP equipped trains that passed each other, there was enough electromagnetic interference between the two systems. They'd both go into emergency brakes automatically. Yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they just um, like, was, they like each other too much. They just stopped to hang out, you know? <laughs> there was one instance in Australia, which is so far the only place that commonly uses ECP on freight trains, but only on certain iron ore trains. Uh, in Australia, they had a virtual train split, right? Which is the system lost communication with the back of the train. It automatically applied emergency brakes. And then when the engineer went back to set handbrakes while the problem was resolved, the ECP system regained contact with the back of the train, released the brakes, and went merrily on its way for 200 kilometers without anyone in it. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. <What? laughs> you just... <laughs> You just stranded dun, 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 an Australian dun, 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 dun. man in the middle of like the Northern Territory or whatever yeah. with like. Oh yeah, you can watch Alice Springs, bud. Good luck. <laughs> like, <laughs> it'll take a while till anyone even knows this happened. Yeah, I was gonna say you did like yeah. the fucking what's that one like American bomber that just got lost in the fucking Sahara? You put that man in a nightmare survival scenario on his yeah. own railroad. Um. Yeah. Another problem is this required every car to be equipped with batteries, which of course caught fire. Um, <laughs> yep. Yeah, I mean the thing is, I was I was originally gonna try and move the uh, cars of vinyl chloride, but then I had to charge my Samsung Galaxy S7. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, oh, I see. You you also watched that video. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. 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 I, it's basically just like dank inc pods. <laughs> increasingly a dank pods fan channel. Yes. Yeah. So this Obama-era mandate for these ECP brakes would have only applied to high-hazard flammable unit trains, right? Um, and that is a train that carries one kind of cargo, a unit train, mm -hmm. and that's... You're, you know, you're a little, like, boutique chemical company that only makes, like, fluorides or whatever. Um, like, a train coming from them with, like, four cars of, like, the nastiest shit in the world is a high-hazard unit train. Uh, no, it is not. No. <laughs> Damn. Uh, okay. Oh. It's like a minimum length here of like 30 cars or something, I want to say. Um, it's like two genders of these trains. You have your, your fracking oil boom train. It's a whole uh -huh. crude oil train. And then you got your Iowa ethanol bomb train. Uh, it's all corn. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> Those are the oh, two the genders bomb. of class three flammable unit trains. So. I think you occasionally get petroleum gas, and um, if the war Sometimes. in Ukraine keeps going, you might see a lot more natural gas by rail. There's um, like one propane unit train in Montana that bridges the pipeline, but hmm. I'm not aware. Well, speaking of, of shipping others. bombs by rail, you know. Yeah. We still do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I mean, b- bombs are heavy. I wouldn't want to fly yeah. them around. No. no. A lot of this is like, theoretically... I, and I retire the B-52... To introduce my bomb train, <laughs> I, I reinvent the nuclear triad by rail anymore. Uh, they took that away from us. I know. Oh, a shame. Yeah, the peacekeeper wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, the strategic oh, rail. There was fucking... the like when they actually just moved the warheads around from Amarillo. Right. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the white train. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, with the, with the, Express. Is that is that is that the missile train or is that the FEMA concentration camp train? Uh, it's the, the that's just all secret, auto cars. Is the third uh, secret very one. obvious nuclear bomb right. train? Yes, that yes, Protesters yes. could easily identify and uh, make a mockery of by blocking the track. Ah, <laughs> uh, I was, yeah, yeah. So, if you have a lot of cars that are in you know sort of captive service, right? They they are they run as a big unit back and forth between Terminal A and Terminal B forever, uh, applying. Co- uh, ECP brakes to those cars and locomotives is easy, and that's why some of the big conveyor belt style iron ore operations in Australia and I think also Quebec actually have started using ECP because it's it's relatively easy to do there. Yeah, a lot uh, of the test trains were coal trains uh, in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, because you just bring that down to Lambert's Point, unload it, and then go back up to the mine. You know, you're literally yeah. going in a loop. Um, that the, so that means you're not oh. applying the system to too many cars. The problem comes when you want this braking system on all the hazmat trains, or even just key trains, as uh, NS32N was, right? Uh, like pretty much every train. Yes. Uh, in certain parts of the country, like Houston has like over you know 130 trains a day. 110 of them have at least five high-level like level hazmat cars. Many of them, many more. So, uh, but, yeah. and, and the idea is to give all of these, all of this rolling stock, these new fancy fucking like Wi-Fi breaks or whatever. But yes. some yeah. of them still have the oily rag bearings. Thankfully, those are gone. Those are gone. Yeah, from normal okay. trains. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you have significant complications now, which is that ECP is sort of an all-or-nothing system. If you want the benefit to the train, every car on the train must have the system installed. Um, theoretically, an ECP car could be controlled through a conventional air brake signal. Not all the systems are engineered for that, and again, you lose all the benefits there. So you you sort of you just have... put a battery on the thing you already have, and you've just yeah. gone, yeah, it's the future now. Hybrid, yeah. <laughs> hybrid, shut up. Yes, yeah, Every, yeah, literally. Everything's, yeah. everything's going to have batteries forever. <laughs> I, even, even where, where are we getting the it? rare earth metals? Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> so I love cadmium. You have <laughs> maybe two possible solutions if you want an ECP mandate, which is either run hazmat in separate trains or upgrade the entire 1.7 million car strong U.S. railroad fleet. It's not just the U.S. It'd be Canada and Mexico too. Yes, you would also need to get Canada and Mexico. <laughs> Um, neither of those are very easy options, you know, and I guess for option one, we've spoken at length in an earlier episode, the, about the railroad's obsession with productivity. They want to run fewer and longer trains, but this has at least allowed them to set very low freight rates. They still charge an arm and a leg for hazmat, but not to the extent that they used to have to, right? But once you have to treat hazmat, especially owing to different brakes, brake systems, the expense of shipping by rail goes up and rail customers are already mad at low quality of service and inconsistency in the fees and the charges. A lot of hazmat shippers would probably say to hell with this and start shipping all their horrible death chemicals on trucks, which are yeah, inherently, fuck. yeah, those, those are inherently more accident prone. And on top of that, from the other end, now you have like, you know, several 
thousand small rail car owners like farmer co-op and randoms town iowa that now can't afford to upgrade their probably 40 year old hopper cars that they don't want to spend all that money on and now you've just utterly thrashed freight transportation in the united states yeah how, yeah. how to push the one button that destroys freight transport uh, on by train and like maybe you could do it with like a lot of federal money mm, and yeah. do it in like five or ten years but you're basically any car that's older than 30 years that car is getting chopped up and instead of getting upgraded you're just building you're, another you're, you're doing like thousand rail cars yeah new deal sort of money and like expensive state power and everything in pursuit of like a pretty marginal benefit that also maybe just doesn't work yeah uh, and, some, and sometimes carjacks your train right <laughs> yeah you're not even getting the good version of ecp like if we had like digital <clears throat> automatic couplers you know yeah. this would work a lot better you're getting the the bargain bin you know garbage Strap a battery yeah. to it and call it good sort of thing. and my my shitty wi-fi router and you know who knows how many of those <laughs> you know think of like you just it, it's like you've now turned every freight car into a printer it, it's now you have all and these I people who don't gun. work with electronics <laughs> yeah. and now they have to also make sure all this other shit works and at the same time you're trying to cut as many of those laborers as possible and now you have to hire a lot more people who know how to work on that stuff. It, it just nightmare. Yeah. Like, and like, not even yeah. a nightmare in like any of the in any of the ways that like upgrading technology usually is. Just like a totally unforced error. Which, yeah. cool. I mean, I I think I speak for all of us when I say that this this podcast is strongly like pro FUD, pro nineteen eleven, pro forty five. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unapologetically, and, yes. Yeah, and, and so we we you know carry that's that why, idea. That's why forward ideally to all BSD, other forms of technology. I hate the future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like, I, I found the one thing that it's it's the same thing with trying to upgrade this uh, this microphone or this soundboard. It's like no, I found one thing that works right. for me. I will use it until I am nine thousand years old. I will. I will never abandon the Procaster. See, I, I, I will yeah. teach my children to use this microphone. Uh, and and their children and their children's children, you know. Um, I can't believe because... you went to the fucking bathroom. God, you know, a lot I'm, of engineering majors and stuff like that will learn this through school eventually, hopefully. Like, nah. you know, sometimes, <laughs> nah. sometimes you know, we figured out the best solution to a problem. But like outsiders to an industry, it's really hard to have the nuance to have any idea what the fuck is going on. I mean, just in general, yeah. I feel like yeah. there's a lot of sort of like places where technology has plateaued, and that's not to say that there's no new interesting developments coming, because of course there are. There's a ton of shit I'm interested in. There are so many like current implementations of things where it feels like there is a generational shift waiting to happen that hasn't, and just everything is like, well, we, this is like a, buy that. a solved technology. You know, your smartphone is as good as it's going to get until someone invents the next thing. Uh, you know, uh, fucking, and I, I feel this way about a lot of stuff. The reason why I went to 1911s there is because I think firearms were like basically there. Uh, and oh, yeah. you know, it, unlike nothing a sort of, really crazy is going on with firearms anymore. No, like, unlike a sort of a personal level, even all the way up to sort of like you know the air force or the navy fucking around with rail guns or like directed energy weapons or whatever, and it's like. No, that's decades away, and even then, it may not like be worth it. Like, I, it feels like we're at sort of like dead ends of things. Um, I'll buy that. And you know, it, it's one of those things where like you need to like have something that like completely shifts the thing and like changes everything. But we just haven't had that yet. And I don't know of what it's going to be. Like does. What did I miss? Uh, technology. I, I got talking just... about guns because I was bored. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and like the technology is kind of an excuse to ignore the very real human problem. Oh you're, yeah, you're, yeah. Well, yeah like you're not yeah, no dealing with the actual structural issue. You're just kind of trying to throw a solution at a problem without, you know, considering that you know there's better ways to just do it what we, with what we have now mm -hmm. that just take a different attitude. Like yeah. Hey, so not to not to not to divert too much, but I'm fucking hungry. Can we wrap this up? 
Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right, let me let me just yeah. sum up here. In 2070, every locomotive looks Buy like a Dash a. Every gun looks like a Glock. Buy a 1911. Uh, <laughs> because it's the best Both one. We wars. figured it out. Both yeah. World <laughs> Wars. Buy a 1911. So, um, you know, uh, I think we mentioned, you know, who really pays for this technology. It's mostly going to be shippers because railroads have sort of gotten out of the business of owning railroad cars. Mm -hmm. You know, they're owned by like Union Tank Car or Railbox or individual businesses or sometimes by short lines who like make a buy a rail car. They make a they make a buck by uh, leasing out these uh, this rolling stock, right? Um, it should be like rail car landlords. We could do that. We could buy one rail car. Probably. Oh, yeah, that's a that's like a big thing. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. you look at like the um, the Arkansas and Oklahoma Railroad is a short line in oh, yeah, the Arkansas and Oklahoma, the AOK. Yeah. And they um they own like thousands of boxcars and they don't use any of them. They just lease them out. Um, <laughs> All right. Uh, Ozark Mountain. Yeah. Um, you know. And the the installing the system, I think I, I read a study from Booz Allen Hamilton that said it would be about four thousand dollars a car, which when you're dealing oh, so with we can buy a we can buy the Salisbury Beach private car. I just need uh, they won't tell me how much it is. Bunch of Nazis. POA. But like just to install the thing is four thousand dollars a car, and that means you're also retraining every mechanic and carman on the railroad, setting up a whole logistics system to get parts supplied, so on and so forth. I'm I'm sure New York Airbrake and Wabtech are watering at this uh, mouth their mouth is watering at this opportunity. But oh, you know, absolutely. You know, we would also have this long period of transition because even when the railroads were bullish on ECP, they thought it would take ten years at minimum to install all this stuff. During this period, huge portions of the railcar fleet would be straight up incompatible with each other, and it would cause sort of chaos and pandemonium on the railroads that we haven't seen since World War I. <laughs> um, so that's sort of the case against DCP here. Um, oh, the other thing is what I thought would be, you know, if, if you did ECP on the entire railroad network, you'd you have absurd situations like the Strasbourg Railroad would have to put ECP on their steam locomotives. <laughs> <laughs> no, just because they yeah, do have an interchange yeah. freight service. Um, yeah. I mean, sure, uh, Br British steam locomotives have to have AWS, so yeah, let's true. do it. They have to wire in a little um, box into, into the thing. But sort of, yeah, the case against ECP, you know, the technology underperformed in real-life conditions, it was unreliable, it would be very expensive and time consuming to effectively implement. And well, maybe if it works as advertised, it would improve safety on the railroad. It's as likely to reduce the safety of the transportation system as a whole, owing to hazmat mode shift to trucking. And we need to let it cook a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not ready. This is not a mature technology. <laughs> um, I think the only places where it is used are those big iron ore trains we mentioned earlier. I think some of the newest Chinese high-speed trains have it. Um, and I think there are... It's on a handful of EMUs in Japan and Europe, but yeah. like those are way easier engineering problems than, you know, 100 car freight trains. Yeah. And just easier problems in general. There's just less physical yeah. work involved. Less failure yeah. points. It's all... It doesn't have to come apart all the time. Like you, you move, remove a lot of the failure modes. Yeah. And in the meantime, you know, railroads have widely adopted something called distributed power, right? That's when you have a locomotive at the front of the train, you have one at the back of the train. A lot of times you have one in the middle of the train. Um, and that means, and these are all controlled by radio. And what this means is when I apply conventional air brakes, right? Um, that brake signal is now propagating from three locations on the train. So even if it's, you know, a, a one and a half or two mile long train, you're still looking at, you know, three or four seconds for that brake signal to propagate, which isn't as good as instant, but pretty close. Sure. Um, <laughs> So it's measured in a couple of seconds, not even double digits for the yeah. whole train to really start feeling any of this. So it's not bad. Yeah. So the very expensive way to theoretically gain a very marginal improvement of safety. Um, and also just totally fuck American railroading. Right. 
Yeah. 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 Oh. You, you screw everything up real bad. We'll let's have fun here. Yeah. Um, all right. That was ECP. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the cleanup process. You can see both those tracks are back. Um, yeah, that's the most important yeah. thing. Things still going. Yeah. You just bury those by the side of the thing. It's Call it good, you know. Yeah, exactly. So, just put up. Thankfully, put a... we don't do that much anymore. <laughs> much, <laughs> much, not that much. Not, not much. Uh, class two and three smaller railroads. The little bastards get away with a lot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was like this period during the Bush era where uh, they, the Bush administration, started realizing they were putting these tiny railroads out of business, and uh, they were like, "Oh God, we have to stop doing this," because. <laughs> Kind of like rolling back to the ECP thing, where it's like, oh, all this freight's gonna start shifting to something that it can't handle it, like, and uh, so like, a lot of class twos and threes just kind of get away with this shit, and uh, that they're scary sometimes. <laughs> well, I... like one I was worked on a lot of like that my railroad had took back from they leased it out and took it back because they started running crude oil on it. And uh, they got utterly terrified of Lock Magantiking, a uh, southwest town, and uh, near uh, the uh, uh, Permian Basin. And uh, they spent like three hundred million dollars rebuilding the entire two hundred and fifty mile long section of track. Like that was crazy. Just found a... each oil train makes a million dollars. So found basically a corduroy road of derailed tanker cars underneath the roadbed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so Norfolk Southern is responsible for the cost to clean up. Uh, your soil was heavily contaminated, not just by the vinyl chloride, but all the other nasty chemicals on the train. Um, the oh, railroad... It's already nasty soil, as we've established. Yeah. The railroad partially reopened on February 9th. Um, they, they've been screwing people over over the like compensation and stuff, like yeah. making people go back to their houses to get documentation yeah, to prove that their the, pets like, died. First offer of like twenty five thousand dollars to the town. Yeah, like, yeah, that was yeah, embarrassing. That was they, they had a they had a town meeting where they like refused to have an executive shot because they thought someone was going to shoot them, which justifiable, understandable. Um, Not yeah, so, they, that's a they, uh, I, I would be worried about that too. <laughs> <laughs> After blowing up their town, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I guess we mentioned a lot about remediation contractors and stuff like that before. Um, you know, uh, uh, you got various government agencies doing soil testing, air quality testing, water testing, so on and so forth. Um, sure. it seems like all most of the tests are coming up pretty clean, except right near the site. Um. They've been trucking all the contaminated soil off site, uh, which has resulted one of those in the trucks crash too. Yeah, one of them yeah, crashed a couple yeah, days ago. That's fun. That's what happens when you use trucks. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. It might a perfect encapsulation of everything wrong with that. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Maybe maybe they should have put it on a train. You Crazy. know? You know, but then they just would have dumped all that soil on the next contractors town aren't down the road. Particularly intelligent. <laughs> They're cheap bastards. They call it Hulcher the Vulture for a reason. <laughs> um, they've also done some tests on the uh, deceased pets. No sign of chemically induced death, which is weird. weird. Yeah. They, maybe they I mean, just did that. I think that's probably points to the tests being inadequate, but I don't this know. Maybe true, they yeah. just like... one funny thing about uh fish that die from stuff like this norfolk southern put a corn on a soybean train on the ground in like atlanta earlier this year or like last year and uh you wouldn't think of soybeans as hazmat but to fish it killed them all in a creek. fish have fish have one hit point like yeah I like just... they are fish kind of just perish with the minor f fish and birds to their water yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. It's because yeah, they can't, they can't do the soy face. The they just uh, rip their face open trying to soy face. It's a shame after the last episode, uh, one of the last ones that came out, you know, deer don't get, you know, knocked out like this too. But uh, uh, uh. 
<laughs> yeah, if we had just Which killed is, a isn't few excusing deer. the railroads, but it's like uh, the good. Like a, a lot of people don't realize just how utterly weak, like vulnerable fish are to like anything. No, I go with weak. Go with weak. Weak. Fish are pussies, and I don't respect yeah. them. <laughs> they must fear the strong mammals. <laughs> yeah. the deer. North, Norfolk like... Southern, the weak should fear the strong. <laughs> Put that on the side of every tank car, you know. The deer with like chronic wasting disease, ha- like taking uh, like chemical weapons to the face and like living through it. You know, maybe everything's just gonna cancel itself out, and it's gonna yeah. be fine. <laughs> maybe I'm not scared anymore. Maybe it's just like everything is gonna be whatever it always was, and it's just gonna be like this, and it's gonna be like every apocalypse trying to get through the door at the same time. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we killed all of the deer and they like filled into the cool dare of a super volcano yes, and stopped yeah. it from erupting. Uh, Frank Furter should have shot the deer. Stone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that brings us to sort of to conclude here. Philosophical issues. Which I think this has brought up. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Everyone's a conservationist yeah. until they get the estimates. Yeah. Oh, truth. Um you know, which the real issue here is car maintenance, right? These railroads have been cutting back on inspections, instructing employees to inspect faster, reducing the amount of people to do so, um, apparently not calibrating defect detectors properly. Um, and what do you do about it? Because the American railroad industry is sort of second only to the Catholic Church in terms of institutional momentum. Um <laughs> You elect just, one like, Argentinian man and don't ask what he did in the dirty power. war. Like, one of the things about railroads, like, we didn't have to do EISs for a lot of shit. We could just do things, like, that other companies can't even think of doing. Like, it was pretty shocking how much the railroad can just do without any oversight at all. Uh, Like, most people just don't realize that like everything from having their own police officers mm-hmm. uh to yeah. i mean like yeah it's crazy just like just like expanding a right of way with like no study uh just like oh, build oh, it yeah. build it and they will come yeah. dude yeah. don't worry about it shut up yeah, just uh, let's let's get the get the rails on the ground before the drawings are even done <laughs> like, <laughs> Oil companies are jealous of this level of institutional power that that's the kind of thing like I think a lot of people don't realize, like, ExxonMobil doesn't have this kind of power, <laughs> which is insane. Yeah, and, and sort of the result of it is, like, Norfolk Southern can do an East Palestine and get away with it, much like how they gassed Graniteville, South Carolina in 2005, mm-hmm. or how they covered Farragut, Tennessee with sulfuric acid in tw- 2002. Which is apparently not that bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, that's molten sulfur, my yeah. fault. Uh, it's not too bad. They also gassed uh, Paulsboro, New Jersey, just across the river from us in 2015 with vinyl chloride. Um, you know, so we, th- these companies see no punishment, and I don't know how you would punish them. <laughs> Nationalize them, and then and yeah. then bring Frank Furness back from the dead to execute them. God yep, yeah, the, the fear the of God. Yeah, mm-hmm. like the. Uh, the regulatory state needs to have the power to put the fear of God into them. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, they have the money. They can fix their problems. They just need to be threatened with a very, very big club. <laughs> de- de- yeah. Debuting my new bit, Railroad Stalin. <laughs> <laughs> That was just Stalin. Stalin really liked railroads, yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Motherfucker built them everywhere, even yeah, in yeah, Siberia. So. <laughs> like Arctic Circle. Yeah, this is, uh, this is sort of, you know, uh, you, you have to regulate these companies uh, like they are, you know, the, like they have the 19th century problems that they have, which is why j- just nationalized them. Just, oh yeah, that's 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 the only like long term solution here. I think that a lot of the regulation, the the regulatory state is just not capable 
of taking on these companies. I, I don't, I don't think it's doable. I think this is, uh, they serve the shareholders above all else. Yes. And what better way to fix it than to make the public, the shareholders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As you've, as you put here in the notes, 19th century problems require 19th century solutions. Yes, that's right. <laughs> the other thing uh, I was going to mention earlier, I forgot to mention earlier is like, um, you know, the, the, the one regulation I could see that would really, you know, have a positive effect that is practical to implement is a federal two man crew rule. And uh, I believe that that got You're very out. close to that. Uh, yeah. I mean, that that is that is maybe the one positive note to end on there is at least we will get a federal two man crew rule and we won't have a situation where, you know, Union Pacific or. BNS at BNSF or someone like that, they put a train on the ground and it's about to explode. And the engineer has to call up the ground based expediter and he'll be like, Oh yeah, I'll be there in two hours to uncouple the cars. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. Like when I was getting, getting hired out, yeah. we w had like at corporate, we had all sorts of like info sessions about all this stuff. I mean, they were hyping the hell out of single man crews because of positive train control. Like that yeah, was the goal. Like that was why the railroad I worked at got it done first, and uh, like ahead of the government mandated schedule that had been rescheduled like five times. But uh, you know, like they they had that. They just yeah, it's just crazy. They need to be saved from themselves. Yeah. Because the incentives that they have right now just push them towards oblivion. Yeah. Uh, ECP brakes, that was another thing designed to facilitate single man crews. Mm -hmm. um, that, that and auto throttle, yeah. those were like the three oh, yeah. technologies. Auto throttle oh, is, God, yeah. that would be a whole other episode. Um, yeah, I mean, I know de of derailments that were caused by all of the train control software just doing the stupidest stuff. Yeah. <laughs> And, 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 you know, those ones barely made the news. Like, one of them was, like, was it, like five cars of molten asphalt dumped into a river in Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> because it the front paradise. locomotive stopped, <laughs> and the back locomotive kept on pushing, and they just kind of, like, a model train just, like, shoved the cars up and, in, like, just into a river. <laughs> like, <laughs> the computer knows best. The computer knows all. The thinking sand yes. knows everything. The train knows where it is. Because mm -hmm. it knows it, where it's not. But where it's not is on the tracks. <laughs> 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 all right. Well, what did we learn? Nothing. Absolutely That's nothing. The fucking railroads. <laughs> well, we have a segment on this podcast called Safety Third. Shake hands with danger. Hello, Justin, Alice, and yay, Liam. No guests. No, no, no guests. guests. Shit. Yeah, yep, shit. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> banned from the podcast. Um, <laughs> Silenced. It's been the edit of Stalin, the guy just redacted out of the. <laughs> With the dangerous world of stagehands coming up a few times, as well as the inefficiencies of American railroading, I thought I'd finally write in to tell you all about the, t the weird period of my life where those two things intersect, my time oh, as no. a carpenter and a rigger for the circus. Oh, <laughs> Crossover no. episode. Yeah. <laughs> I lived in a four by seven room on a train car with 13 other people in similar rooms. We would be parked in random rail yards at the, on the edges of towns and taken to work each day in a bus that got on the cheap because it got flooded out in Hurricane Katrina. The highlight of the job was the one or two days a week you spent as the lowest priority freight train seeing a completely different side of America than I ever did from the bus and the truck tours later. The, uh, entire thing was funded by a snow cone and light up crap pyramid scheme. The crew were unionized under a metal workers local in St. Louis. Script was still a thing that existed in this world. There were all the inherent dangers of uh, trained large animals who weren't treated that bad, but I don't know if I have an NDA. So I signed in uh, this NDA I signed in 2011 is still valid. 
so I probably shouldn't be this specific. Um, I will say that tigers can piss like laser beams. <laughs> <laughs> what a perfect sentence. Who amongst us, you know? Yeah. <laughs> My That's first... gotta be hazmat, right? Yeah, yeah I, I think a tiger is hazmat. <laughs> yeah. I gotta put ECP brakes on the circus train. Yeah. <laughs> On the hundred year old sleeper cars. Yeah. <laughs> My first load in, we got a surprise OSHA inspection, which we failed miserably. Lots of the crew were Eastern European acrobats who defected in the 80s. There's more of the general unsafe and weird work environment than I could possibly fit into the one safety third submission. Man, imagine defecting, thinking, oh, I'm going to America, you know, it's uh, going to have freedom, it's going to have, like, you know, I can drive my Corvette to the grocery store, yeah. and then you end up in a fucking 100-year-old train, train car, <laughs> being oh, pissed on by a tiger. This is an upgrade. Which is apparently like a laser beam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> However, I think my funniest incident related to workplace safety I had was later in my career, when I moved beyond the world of the redacted brother circus to the classy <laughs> high-end world of pretentious French-Canadian circus. 5,000 years of French-Canadian history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See Canada, Canada before Canada. communism. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to be thinking right, about like Quebec. Genuinely, it sounds like yeah, nothing has what? changed yeah. since like the the like stories of the 30s. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, nothing has changed. Well, I'll keep Shen Yun in mind. Our show had an upcoming gap of a few months, and a Chinese vulture capital firm who owned a large portion of the company needed a tax write-off. They proposed plugging the gap in our schedule with a four-month res residency in a temporary arena in Sanya in China. Huh. Between oh. signing the contracts and opening night was 88 days. Put a pin in that number for later. Days before the production crew was supposed to arrive on site, the concrete slab had yet to be poured. While we were, when we finally arrived on site, the still in some places visibly wet concrete was ready for us to go, despite the objections from much of the carpentry, carpentry crew about the ability of uncured concrete floor to hold our incredibly heaving, moving set pieces. We laid down our show floor, and after just a few days of shows, the area underneath our massive set pieces had been shifting making them incredibly difficult to move and absolutely destroying our fancy stage decking. Upon, upon pulling a few of the floor decks, we discovered that not only had the concrete shrunk like we said it would, but the stage decks were dripping in water in the, trop in the tropical Hainan Island climate. Um, cool. Yeah. After hours of listening to my supervisor repeatedly cursing the Lord in that lyrical way they do up in Quebec, as he futilely <laughs> shoved shims under our decks, he said it was... <laughs> 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 At least a tabernacle. I can't imagine a more out of place, play, place for someone from Quebec to be in, like, southern China. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 in like some resort city like like drift <laughs> town in southern china like how could you be more out of place <laughs> what the fuck that was the, that was the the only 307 times the tabernacle was set on that island yeah <laughs> <laughs> He said it was good enough, and we went back to doing shows for empty crowds for three months as the mold grew and grew underneath. The sinus infection I, got, infection I got when we finally loaded out made for what was by far the worst international flight I've been on and would repeat every subsequent week of we moved the show until I quit before participating in a PR campaign for MBS and Vision 2030. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. What? I mean, okay, what, I know in a what, broader what sense, capitalism is, is a circus, is right? Industry? But like, yeah. what? I didn't realize it was that much on the front lines of it, you yeah. know? 
Now, remember how I mentioned the number 88? The show's PR people thought it was an impressive feat to have gone from nothing to a venue in 88 days. So they had begun inadvertently using Nazi code to promote our show on social media. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I, oh, I, 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 I was, was wondering so if I was like, going to plop in. Every aspect of this is like, oh yeah, the, the, they hired us to like do a show on, a disp- on like the Paracel Islands, like disputed <laughs> between China and Japan. They like reclaimed <laughs> land to build the stage on it. After that, we're going to Neon. Like, <laughs> fucking... <laughs> Most circuses cannot be this like geopolitical, surely. What? I mean, we're what? talking about a clown show, goddamn. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my god. What the fuck is this? Then the MBS part that's just thrown in there. That's just... <laughs> what the fuck? I quit because I didn't want to meet MBS. Yeah. <laughs> God, yeah, I wouldn't want to either. Yeah. yeah. Please keep up the great work and special thanks to Alice for helping me accept that I could live how I always wanted without having to do voice training. From Aww. May. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, yeah. so sweet. Yeah. Do I, do I have a clown drop? Uh... RIP to the circus train. Actually, there's still one left. It's the straight shows train. But I don't think they have the crew on board anymore. It's just all the trailers and crap. It's mm. very funny to see HPP8s pull that like couldn't pull anything pulling the circus train. Yeah. <laughs> last photo. Can hold one tiger. Exactly. <laughs> One tiger and two elephants. And wheel slip. Yeah. <laughs> like the sand is on, it's just fucking going. Well, I put the elephant, they had the elephant drive the train, so it ballasts it and gets more grip. <laughs> you might be onto something there. Yeah. Don't mm. tell Alstrom that. <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, no man, one elephant crew rule. Mm-hmm. Ultimate labor-saving device. Yeah. Elephants don't unionize. At least I don't think they do. Yeah, oh. you, you, you can pay them peanuts. Oh. <laughs> it could work me. for like 50 years. End the show. Years. End, End the, the show deal. now. End, End the show. show. End the show. Uh, our next episode is on Chernobyl. Does anyone have any commercials before we go? I'm so hungry, dude. Sorry. I don't cool. got any It's a commercial for being hungry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> If the people want more Brian, where can they find more Brian? Uh, four foot and a half on Twitter. Uh, I sometimes t- I talk a little bit about freight rail stuff usually. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes I help Alan Fisher make videos. Uh, other than that, I don't got anything to plug, really. Yeah. Hell yeah. All Thanks right. so much for coming on. Yeah, oh, Thank you for coming blast. on. This was good. Yeah, I, I had a lot of fun. All right, and we have a Patreon. We have a bonus Patreon. episode yeah, bonus once a month, episode. ideally. Sometimes Hopefully, you sometimes. can you can get it. You can pay for us. Uh, thanks. Bye. Yeah. Auf Wiedersehen. Another podcast that will piss Stefan off. Yes. yes.